Council meeting number 21-18 to order. Uh, Brett, roll call, please. Council member Cook. Here. Evans. Martin. Here. Ready. Here. Perfect. Here. I want to welcome everyone that is in the audience with us this evening. If you are here for an item that is on the agenda, we would ask you to wait for that item to come up and address the council at that time. If you're here for an item that is not on the agenda, there will be an opportunity under public communications, which will be coming up here shortly and you can address the council then. The next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. And we usually ask the youngest person in the room to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, but maybe they don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any other young people in the room that might be willing to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> How about, is Josh Kennedy here? There he is. Josh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is the agenda approval. Jim, do we have any changes to the agenda? Council changes? Nope. Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? I move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Brett, vote please. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yep. Yeah. Burkhart? Yes. Cool. Yes. Motion approved. Next item on the agenda is public communications, and we do have two scheduled public communications this evening. The first being a presentation on the Polk County Water and Land Legacy Bond. And I believe Rich Leopold is going to present to us. We've got PowerPoint coming up here. I have a PowerPoint. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you this evening, Mayor and City Council members. Um, my name is Rich Leopold. I'm Director of Polk County Conservation and a proud citizen of the City of Johnston. So, yay! <laughs> Love having you here. Um, so tonight I want to talk to you about uh, Polk County Conservation's uh, Water and Land Legacy. And you know what? This is an old slide program. Who is our IT expert? Well, there's no expert here. The new one has pretty pictures. Oh, wonderful. Stories. A lot of <coughs> All right. Much prettier picture. Oh, yeah. Very nice. So, um, most of you have been around the bottom. You know that in 2012, we passed a bond, the Polk County Water and Mine Legacy Bond. This is a rerun of that bond. So, at that point in time, we had uh, 50,000 or 50,000, 50 million dollars. 72% of Polk County residents voted for this. We <coughs> include a number of things that I'll be talking about here shortly. Um, this bond is now coming up November 2nd of this year uh, is for 65 million and it's largely to doing the same kind of thing. So <coughs> what I want to do tonight is I want to first of all, just kind of recap the things that that last bond did and then look to the future and especially what it means to, uh, to the city. So thank you for being nimble on that. I will work here. There we go. So these are some of the details: um, water quality, river protection, wildlife, nature preservation, flood mitigation, outdoor recreation, and trails. That's what we do. Um, the campaign team. We think we put together a pretty pretty good team right now. Very bipartisan. Um, these are our leaders. So we have Mark Appleson, who is the former president and CEO of Biomatch Heritage Foundation. He also led the last campaign, so he's well qualified for that. Uh, Tom Levis, he's an attorney and was actually on the Polk County Conservation Board for 10 years. So one of my past bosses and helped spend a lot of that money. So he's, he's an expert on how we use that money. Uh, Pat Bodie, a lot of people know Pat. She's many different things. She was former director of Polk County Conservation. 
uh, former uh, deputy director of the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and many other incarnations in our county. Uh, Chris Hensley, former city council person for the city of Des Moines. Uh, Jerry Nugent with uh, Nat Properties, a lot of people know Jerry. And Ryan Crane, uh, he is uh, currently the Polk County Conservation Chair. And he is also the philanthropic director for the Des Moines Playhouse. So that's the team that we have leading this campaign. These are the reasons that we give the bumper stickers, if you will, on why to support this uh, bond referendum. Uh, uh, water quality stewardship, it's a lot about water. We'll see that. And more and more, we're talking about quality of life too. So, uh, you know, it, it's about outdoors and recreation, environmental education, and all of this. But um, as anybody knows, that the workforce now is a little bit different than when it was 20, 40 years ago. It used to be you got a job and then you moved to that place. Now, if you look for where you want to live, you go there and you get a job. Um, so, quality of life and recreational amenities and clean water and these things are very important. You'll notice, what is it, the one, two, three, fourth picture down? Unfortunately, that's part of Johnson right there. That's the uh, trestle, the trestle Bridge. And I promise you, we're working to, to get that thing fixed. It's, and we do appreciate your help on yes, that. Thank it's you. It's going to be going out for bid, hopefully, uh, this fall. Johnson has been an important part, partner all the way along with that. So, it's happening. It's just slow. Um, here's some of the specifics. So, this is a 20 year bond. Um, it has a public audit, of course. Uh, figure the cost to the average homeowner. So that's the average cost of a home in Polk County. It's going to be $11 a year for 20 years. Um, we feel pretty good about that number right there. When uh, we're working with the uh, Trust for Public Lands, and they do this all over the United States, and they're telling us, well, probably somewhere between 20 and 30 is going to be good range for you. You get over 30, we start getting nervous. $11 is a spectacular number. It has a lot to do with our property valuations, our bonding capacity, uh, all the ratings and everything else. So Polk County right now is sitting really, really good. And we leverage this money. This money is gold. So of the 50 million we were originally given in 2012, we've already leveraged, I think it's 42 and a half. And by the time we're done with that spending, I think it'll be a one-to-one. -one. I anticipate that being the same with this uh, next one. So we leverage that out quite well. These are some of the projects um, that we did the last time, and I will get to some Johnson-specific discussions here. These are county-wide, but when I'm talking with city councils, I also remind them that you know everybody that lives here is a citizen of Johnston. They're also a citizen of Polk County, so you know a lot of what we do with environmental education and outdoor recreation and preservation of natural resources to have impact for everybody that lives in the county. Um, uh, this here, probably what the closest one is the Jester Park Nature Center. It's not too far away. Um, out there, a $10 million nature center has uh, really improved things. You know, this last year, um, and not just because of the improvements made, you know, COVID has kind of opened everybody's eyes too, but we experienced a 31% increase in the use of our parks and trails. It's just been amazing. I'm sure you could attest to the same thing. You know, I know John here, he'd probably say the same thing that's happened here in Johnson. Um, the, the, the numbers, Last year, our parks and trails, we had 4.2 million visitors, which is an astounding number of people that are getting out. And early trends are saying that even with COVID now reopening parts of society, those people are staying out. Uh, they're finding out it's easy, it's convenient, it's fun, it's paid for. <laughs> so we're seeing our park usage up quite a ways. Um, another thing um, I'll point out here is the Four Mile Greenway. Now, Four Mile isn't here, it's on the eastern part of town. Um, but this is a conversation I've been having with cities is we didn't set out to do the four mile green belt. Four mile creek had a flood. It had 10 inches of rain in Aikney. It all came down, washed out a whole bunch of homes in, in Pleasant Hill and in Des Moines. Uh, Des Moines came to us and uh, they had had three 100 year floods in the last 10 years and said, we're done with this. We need to do something different. So we pulled our resources with the city of Des Moines and that was bond money that we used and it's, it's hard to talk about it because it's heartbreaking, but we had to buy out 300 homes, close to 300 homes, pull those and down, pull up utilities, created a 640 acre green belt through Pleasant Hill and Des Moines. Um, those are one of the ways that we can partner with different cities in, in helping when good things or bad things happen. Another thing is when we do that, we also look at things like upland water retention, stream bank remediation, stuff like that. So for example, Right now, if you're doing a lot on Beaver Creek, 
and it's awesome. And I've floated down Beaver many, many times. The more ins and outs you put in, the happier I'm going to be. Um, but Beaver Creek is temperamental. It's a small creek that goes up and down quick. Uh, you have a, a, a neighbor, uh, Camp Dodge, that's a big part of that. And part of it goes beyond any of our control, right? So we're able to work with you, Camp Dodge and others, to see if we can look at outland water potential or fixing stream channels or uh, whether it's uh, recreating wetlands. And I know you, you know, put in some oxbows and stuff like that out by Terra and, and areas like that. <laughs> Um, so we can also be a partner in those types of things. We've done it before. Last thing I'll mention on this slide is trails. Um, so I think going into the next one, well, that just shows you some of the breakdown. But uh, we do a lot of connecting communities by trails. So Johnson, Des Moines, um, oops, getting ahead of ourselves here. Um, a lot of these uh, cities are doing their own trail systems. And a lot of what we've tried to focus on is connecting other communities. So for example, right now, looking forward, how do we connect Jester Park to Johnson? Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that for a long time. You go up the side of Sailorville, you go up and then cut across, across the north of Camp Dodge there, and then somehow get on the 141 project. Um, Brian, Grimes and Granger are in the same conversation. So we have been talking about um, how to connect. Um, another one that's fairly close, well, Trestle, Trestle Trail, of course, that's been everybody's uh, favorite love and favorite nightmare. You know, we're getting close on that and that's, we've been in heavy partnership with that. Another one we're looking at that's pretty close is uh, Broadway. So if you know where Chautauqua Valley Trail comes down through Bondurant and then it dead ends at Broadway on the north side of Des Moines, we're gonna be taking that all the way across the north side of town um, up to Bridgestone Firestone on 2nd Avenue there, cutting south of that and then connecting up with the Neil Smith Trail, which is very close to what you have out here. Um, once that's connected, that will be a wonderful circuitous route on the northern uh, suburbs uh, to tie in Aikney and Des Moines and um, clear over to uh, Bondurant and Altoona. So we do a lot in focusing with that thing. Um, another one is a little bit further away, but it's still the same. Ball Park is Polk City. Polk City has long wanted to connect to the High Trestle Trail. So we're working with Polk City shooting north of Polk City connects them with the High Trestle Trail and all the improvements they're making to their trail system. So those are the, some of the things we do. Um, this next bond, we have some of the high profile um, um, projects. Let's see, push it back, there we go. So if you watch the news last week, we got Sleepy Hollow. So we worked with Polk County Board of Super, uh, Supervisors and we bought Sleepy Hollow. Now, on this side, you're a little bit spoiled and pretty close to Jester Park and a lot of our winter sports, the cross-country skis and the uh, snowshoes we have out there. We're going to hopefully make an ice rink this next year, although you got your own up by the library, I know. Um, at Sleepy Hollow, we're also going to have cross-country skis and snowshoes. We have the traditional sledding. Um, we're going to bring back the, the boarding, the tubing, the snowboarding, and maybe even looking at some downhill. Um, we're also going to build a, another uh, campground there. We cannot build our campgrounds fast enough. Um, they're filled all the time. So it's gonna be a 60 uh, site full service campground. It's along a trail system, the Gailey Wilson trails along the east side of Sleepy Hollow and then uh, four mile runs through there so we can work on the water trail system. Uh, I spoke to some of these other ones here. The uh, last one I'll talk about, Central Iowa water trails. So this one here is $65 million. This bond ask is for. 50 is for the traditional, what we did before. 15 is for water trips. But that doesn't mean we just write them a check and they go have fun. Um, 5 million of that 15 has to be Polk County Conservation. So we're gonna be working on areas that we own or operate and putting our own amenities into the water trail system. The other 10 million, um, we have to own or manage forever whatever we spend buy money on. So when we look at what that water trail system is, we're going to be looking at what other communities are doing, uh, talking with Des Moines. Some of it's probably going to be downtown, right? So it might be the Center Street project, it might be the Scott Street project. One of them we're going to likely own and manage. Um, that's the way that's looking. Another thing I'll mention with Central Iowa Water Trails is we do a lot with water quality. So the, the state and the feds, they don't have much of a footprint as far as monitoring water quality. We do a good job in our country of monitoring drinking water. We have the best, safest drinking water on the planet. When it comes to just water running in our streams and lakes, not so much. So they came to Polk County Conservation early, Central Iowa Water Trails did, and said, K 
can you tell us if the water is safe or not? Well, I can if you give me enough money and enough time. So they did. They gave us a bunch of money and a bunch of time. We've been monitoring for two years now. And we're looking at things like turbidity, how, how clean or dirty the water is, E. coli levels, we're looking for human pathogens. We're looking at different risk assessments. So what people are gonna be doing in the water, if they're gonna be paddling, if there's gonna be kids splashing around <coughs> getting frogs, um, if they're gonna be full immersion swimming. Uh, we're looking at different water levels, whether they be high, medium, and low, the safety factors around them and the water quality risk factors. So we'll be involved a lot. And you, you are ahead of the curve when it comes to the water trails, but we'll be involved a lot in how we assess our water quality how we keep it safe and how we talk to people about it. So whether it be a web-based application or what, uh, we'll be in we'll be in partnership with you all on that kind of stuff. Um, just briefly, I wanted to touch on a few of the um, polling takeaways. So we did some extensive polling. Um, this is an off-year election. You all are in the political know. You know that in an off-year election, it's a different electorate, right? It's a generally well, more well-educated generally older, and it's generally uh, people that are really paying attention to politics and conservative. <laughs> Those are kind of the typical things you see in not your election. So we surveyed 300 potential voters. We didn't just get 300 people, but we had a professional firm look at potential voters. We're encouraged by these numbers. 75% favored a $65 million bond. Now, you know, knock on wood, um, you never want to be too cocky about that. Right? We're confident, but we're, we're not cocky. You're going to have to work at this. But when they did the 2012 bond, the initial polling showed 48%. Mm. They passed with 72. We're starting at 75. We feel good about that. But we're talking with you know any groups like the taxpayers and some of the uh, association and some of those. We're talking with them already about the impacts and what we're going to do with this. Anything that has to do with water polls, very, very high. We're very sensitive to flooding and climatic shift and things that are happening in our natural community. Um, we're very sensitive to what happens with our drinking water. And of course, there's a lot of publicity around that. Now, what we do isn't gonna solve Raccoon River drinking water problem, but it's contributing in the right direction. We're gonna be cleaning up, uh, working on stream bank remediation, upland water retention, water quality measures within Walnut Creek, Beaver Creek, Gator Creek, Four Mile Creek, and some of these other ones along with direct practices up into the raccoon watershed. So we're not gonna solve it, but it's going in the right direction. We think that we're very accountable. So we have third party firms that come in and review all of our documents and make sure that uh, uh, we're doing what we say we're gonna do. And lastly, this is a, a tough one. They trust us, 73% of them. When you talk about political polling, whether you're talking about president, US Senator or whatever, <laughs> all those politicians, you know, and then polling generally comes really low no matter what. So coming in, we're feeling pretty good about this. So Polk County supervisors were actually just a few points under us. So um, at least right now, at this moment in time, we're feeling good about the, these polling numbers. So that leads into things that I'm not going to talk about because I'm mostly here just for informational purposes. And I'm going to stop and ask if there's any questions or comments. Thank you for your time. Any questions or comments for yes. Rich? Um, hi, uh, thank you very much. It's really good presentation. We like what you're doing. A couple of questions. The water trial that you put up is just for, how does the water trial work? It's just connecting all the different water trials and used for recreation purposes like yeah. kayaking. And I read something about white water rafting. Is that all part of the same thing? So yes, there's a total of 86 sites that have been identified. The three big ones are the whitewater rafting and all of that downtown on the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers. There's 83 sites that are everywhere. Okay. Um, two of the first are right here in Johnson, actually, um, that are part of that 83 site network that's going to connect all of central Iowa as far as water and water trips. Okay. It, it, it's, it, it's actually, I'm really excited. It's going to be a great thing. We don't have mountains. We don't have the Grand Canyon here, but we've got water like nobody's business. And if you've ever been out on the water, uh, it's, it's amazing. You can go right through the middle of Johnson and feel like it's the 1800s. Sure, that is true. Um, <clears throat> uh, second question I had, the polling that you did, what is the sampling of that questionnaire? Is that what amount of the people that were sampled? How many people? Sure. What percentage of all county was? It was uh, 300 people, and it was a plus or minus 5% on that. 
and it was screening mechanisms that allowed only for likely voters in the soft year election. So those were some of the general criteria we used. Okay. Three and dead people out of, I don't know what's the population of Paul Candy. Yeah, it, they went for a level of statistical relevance. So whenever you're polling, you try to get that plus or minus as low as you can. Sure. And 300 people was able to statistically support the plus or minus five. All right, okay. Thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? My only comment would be, um, you can't build a bike trail up to Jester Park fast enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and actually out to Granger too, and and safe bike bike trails are so needed. I mean, we just had another death here in Urbandale, so please work on those connections. Uh, they are so needed. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more because we have. I, I our offices are at Jester Park, so I drive from Johnston to Jester, Jeff, Jester, Jester every day, and I see bikers on the road, and they got the flashing lights and everything else, but there's no shoulders on most of those roads. It's, very dangerous. Um, we have over a million visitors a year at Just the Park. We need to figure out multimodal transportation, how to get bikers out there. So yeah, it's, it's one of our top priorities. Well, thank you, Rich, for coming this evening. Thank you for presenting to us. Thank you for being a Johnston resident. And thank you for working with us on the Trussell or Trussell or, you know, in our conversations with Camp Dodge on what we can do with the trails and everything else. So appreciate it. Thank you. We have one other scheduled public communication this evening, and that is um, our chief, our police chief, and uh, presenting some performance achievements as well as recognition of new staff. Good evening. Um, I'm I get the privilege of introducing a couple new staff members to you this evening, and we're also going to take this opportunity to uh, reward some strong achievements on, on a couple other officers. So um, to, to begin tonight, I'm going to call forward Josh Kennedy. Josh, if you could come join me, please. Uh, I think most of you are very well aware of Josh and, and his new role, but for those in the audience that don't, he's our, our new community affairs coordinator. And we brought Josh on and, and tapped into a, a talent that, that we think is going to do amazing things for the Johnston Police Department. We were really challenged to reimagine where we stand in our community and what we can do differently. Historically, you look at, at policing and how we respond to calls for service. A lot of times it's, it's pretty systematic. You have a uniformed police officer show up at that call for service. They try to solve the problem. And if they can't, then they write up the case and they work towards an investigator following through and trying to introduce services. What we're doing with Josh's position is, is creating a, a whole new way of looking at some of those challenges. A lot of times as we grow, uh, we can't spend as much time in some of those incidents as we want to, or they're very complex. So with the position that, that Josh holds, he's going to be working to try to unite resources with those families and those individuals in need. It could be human services, social services, mental health services, whatever it may be, he's going to, to work to try to introduce and be a liaison uh, with those services throughout Polk County to try to, to bolster what we offer to our community and really get to the roots and causes and, and deal with some of the complex issues that we sometimes face in policing. So uh, I just want to give you a brief background on, on Josh's experiences for those that aren't aware of his prior professional experience. He's a graduate from Briarcliff University. He's lived in Greater Des Moines for about 20 years. He's a well-known and respected resource to the youth of this community, having worked at the Johnston Community School District for the last 14 years as a juvenile court services liaison. He's also has professional experience as a drug court case manager for children and families of Iowa and as a youth counselor at Woodward Academy. Josh has also been very creative and, and active in service projects in and around the communities that he served. He's led brothers to brother, various aggression replacement trainings, and he's been very active in coaching youth sports for the last several years. His primary expertise as we look at him is really assisting in the setup of those services and to help families and students to this point, whether it's a mental or physical barrier. He's helped a lot of people overcome their, their hardships in the last 20 years in, in this Polk County and Johnston community. So we're extremely excited to have Josh on board with us. He's been here about a month now. Uh, he's, he's met a lot of people and had a lot of great conversations already, uh, but we're really excited about the future of Josh brings to us. So Josh, do you wanna offer anything real quick? That's 
Uh, thank you, Jimmy Daniels. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to meet and see all you guys and all of behind the show, too. I uh, just want to thank you for the opportunity. You know, this is a great forward thinking project that we're kind of endeavored upon. And I look forward to kind of you know, sharing my talents and my time wise, sharing the co op community as much as possible. Welcome, Josh. You've got a great track record. Um, this is an exciting new position, and we're looking forward to seeing what you do with it. So, okay. Next up, I'd invite Officer Andrew Hayes to step forward, please. Officer Hayes is our newest. Uh, police officer. He's a native of central Iowa, having graduated from Grinnell High School before pursuing his college education and law enforcement career in the state of Minnesota. Officer Hayes comes to us with more than four years of policing experience, and the majority of which was, was with uh, Cook County Sheriff's Office in northern Minnesota. He's also had a full time position prior to his full time position in law enforcement. He served as a community service officer, reserve police officer, code enforcement intern uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, Andy has a Bachelor of Science in, in Criminal Justice with a minor in Psychology from University of Northwestern at St. Paul. He also successfully completed his clinical law enforcement certification coursework through Rasmussen College. Been looking forward to returning to Iowa and being a little bit closer to family, and he's very excited and engaged, or excited to be engaged in our community policing philosophies here in Johnson. So with that, Honorable Mayor, I will turn it over to you for an oath of office. Family, if you want to take photographs or videos or anything, happy to perform the honors. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Andrew Hayes, I will swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and that I will faithfully and impartially. To the best of my ability, the best of my ability, discharge all the duties, discharge all the duties of the office of, of the office of police officer in Johnston, Iowa, police officer in Johnston, Iowa, as now or hereafter, as now or hereafter, required by law, required by law. Congratulations. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I got my father right there. <laughs> <laughs> got uh, two staff members to award recognition to. I'd ask Officer Nathan Johnston to step forward for me, please. We're awarding Officer Johnston, Officer City of Johnston, Officer Johnston. Tonight <laughs> 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 um, so we're going to recognize Nate for his, uh, his efforts in the course of this last year with a letter of appreciation. Uh, from July 1st, 2020 until June 30th of 2021, Officer Nathan Johnston served on first watch, which is our night shift, distinguishing himself as a highly motivated patrol officer whose dedication to proactive criminal interdiction and the safety of Johnston residents and businesses 
was unparalleled. During that time, Officer Johnston completed 140 criminal charges for crimes that occurred within the city limits. This is the highest of all officers on our department and far exceeded the night shift's performance expectations. Officer Johnston's arrests were quality arrests that included 50 charges for, for illegal narcotics, 20 arrests for driving while barred or suspended license, nine operating while intoxicated arrests, and four illegal weapons arrests in addition to two pursuit charges. Officer Johnson, this award recognizes your exceptional ability to remain focused on law enforcement's fundamental duties, safeguard lives and property, protect the peaceful against violence or disorder, and respect the constitutional rights of all persons to liberty, equality, and justice. The performance is a credit to our proactive policing efforts in Johnston, and it gives me great pleasure to award you with this letter of appreciation. I will also add that this Friday, Officer Johnston is going to be recognized by the Central Iowa Traffic Safety Task Force as their Traffic Safety Officer of the Year. So we're very excited that Nate's had a good quality year with us, and we wanted to recognize that achievement. Yeah. <laughs> like my kids, you want to look all around. One more. Okay. I think I got one. <laughs> Are you proud of that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are. <laughs> <laughs> For our final recognition tonight, I'd call forward Officer Dylan Petermeyer. This will be a certificate of commendation. On April 4th, 2021, Officer Dylan Petermeyer was working night shift patrol when he was dispatched to a local apartment community for a stabbing. Upon arrival at the scene, he located a victim that had a large stab wound in his, in his back. Officer Petermeyer was able to recognize the severity, severity and complexity of the injury, and if left untreated, was potentially fatal due to a possible punctured lung. Based on Dylan's law enforcement and military experience, Officer Petermeyer took decisive action to clean the wound and apply a self-venting chest seal. This helped to stabilize the wound and may have saved the victim's life. Even though the victim was uncooperative with law enforcement's efforts, Officer Peter Meyer's ability to remain calm and handle this dynamic situation with professionalism and comp compassion is a shining example of our agency's core values of honor, protection, and service. Dylan, this certificate of commendation is to recognize your quick, decisive, potentially life-saving actions at a chaotic scene. The performance is a credit to this department's community caretaking efforts and is in keeping with the uppermost traditions of selfless public service. You contributed significantly to the mission of my command and to be and to the continued well being of the city of Johnston. It gives me great pleasure to offer you this combination. <laughs> Thank you, all of our police officers. You make uh, incredible sacrifices for us, and you know that every day that you go 
You show up and work, but you're putting your lives on the line for us. We're safe because you're here and we thank you for that. So I appreciate it. That is all of the scheduled public communications that we have this evening. Uh, we're still under public communications. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on an item that is not on the agenda? Seeing none in the audience, Brett, can you tell if there's anybody online that would like to speak to us? I haven't had any, uh, no, nobody's. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to public hearings. First public hearing that we have this evening is to conduct a public hearing and consider resolution number 21-279, approving and authorizing execution of a First Amendment and Development Agreement by and among the City of Johnston, Birchwood Crossing Business Park 1, LLC, and Hubble Realty Company. And we'll open this public hearing at 736. Adam? Good evening, Council. Uh in October of 2018, the City Council approved the development agreement with Hubble for the last two lots in Birchwood Court. And that was about 20 years after the initial development got underway there. Uh, under this report, we've been awaiting uh, the street connection there of Carter Court to develop those last two lots. Um, Hubble is proposing at the time two 72,000 square foot flex stack buildings. Uh, after the agreement, the first one was uh, shortly thereafter constructed. Uh, with the second one anticipated to follow shortly behind both receiving a five-year 80% TIF rebate as part of that development package along with the construction of Carter Court. Um, the first building did experience some of the leasing difficulties due to COVID. Uh, it is now just about fully leased. Uh, Hubble's looking to hopefully we get started on the second building sometime in the near future. Uh, but as part of their financing, they're looking to refinance uh, the first building now that that one is completed and looking at different partnerships for the construction of the second building or the sale of the second building. Uh, so they've requested to bifurcate the development agreement which addresses both of these lots into two separate agreements. Uh, staff doesn't have any concerns over that separation of the two. Uh, and as part of that agreement, we're also uh, included in their uh, removable, uh, removal of uh, many storage buildings as an eligible use in that PUD. Uh, current PUD, PUD language is a little unclear on whether that would be allowed or not, although it would not be eligible for a rebate agreement. Uh, so this clarifies that. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward agreement. Uh, as I said, the uh, second building and the second lot then uh, would still be anticipated for the 72,000 square foot building. Uh, we do extend, uh, due to the COVID market conditions, 18 months, the deadline for that construction to be completed. Uh, so that moves that date back to January 31st of 2025. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Council, have any questions for Adam? If not, do we have anyone in the audience who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing then at 7.38. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-279? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Brett, vote please. Ready. Yes. Hi. Burkhardt. Yes. Vote. Yes. Martin. Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item seven or four B, conduct a public hearing and consider resolution number 21-278, approving a, approving a first phase minimum improve, improvement agreement with Hanson JTC LLC, authorizing annual appropriation tax increment payments and pledging certain tax increment revenues to the payment of the agreement. And we'll open this public hearing at 739. Proposed development agreement with Hanson Real Estate for the first two commercial buildings in the Johnston Town Center. Um, for the past couple of years, Hanson's been diligently working towards uh, their commercial developments. I said it's been different to, uh, market conditions out there, but earlier this year they did indicate 
willingness to move forward with spec building uh, number one off of 62nd, right off the corner of Merle Hay Road. Um, and as the conversations have progressed, uh, they're working out doing both buildings on the corner uh, to tie in kind of the entranceway feature into the town center along with that archway and that pedestrian walkway that would look uh, northeast uh, from that intersection. In March of 2021, Council discussed uh, the proposed terms that have been going back and forth with the Economic Development Committee uh, and staff in Hanson for part of the year. Uh, and we've now adopted those terms into the proposed development agreement here this evening. Uh, I'm just going to cover uh, some of the baseline terms there if there's any questions over those. Uh, and also note um, the development agreement uh, includes language uh, indicating that this, uh, the terms of this agreement are stipulated due to the COVID. 19 pandemic market conditions are not reflective of typical city policy or an indicator of future city policy, uh, which will be evaluated as market conditions continue to evolve. Uh, so the terms of the agreement include uh, building one and two land acquisition at $10 a square foot. Uh, that would add up to $103,000, $10 for lot one and $191,440 for lot two. 100% uh, TIF rebate until each of these buildings receive, um, re reaches a 75% occupancy. Uh, thereafter, it would be a 10-year 75% rebate uh, based off the TIF tax rate for a maximum duration of 12 years. Uh, but Troy, speak any further about some of the potential tenants that are lined up for the building, but we are looking for hopefully uh, higher than 75% occupancy fairly, quick, fairly quickly. So we'll probably be looking at a 10-year 75% rebate, uh, which is in line with the town center TIF policy. Uh, you'll see in the agreement there are some maximum rebate amounts included. Uh, just as a reminder of our process for that, we do ask the developer to give us um, their predicted assessed value of the buildings. And then we drive back from that based off of the typical TIF tax rate. Uh, and looking at this instance, uh, the full 12-year rebate cycle, uh, what those maximum rebates are. Be 1.5 million and 1.43 million. The actual TIF rebate amount would be uh, dependent on the Polk County Assessor's actual assessed value, that year's actual TIF tax rate, um, and that would that would be what would drive uh, the TIF rebates in addition to the building on. Uh, common area maintenance costs. Um, the current uh, slate for that is that each of these buildings would pay on a per square foot basis based off of the anticipated full build out of the town center. There's a second maintenance cost out there for entertainment. Uh, as we work to stand up Benny Works entertainment programming over the next three years, um, Hanson for the building owners would not pay any cam costs for the entertainment. Uh, and then at year four, it would go into the typical common area maintenance costs for both the entertainment and the maintenance, which is on a per square foot basis uh, for the costs uh, to be incurred for both of those operations, which is determined by the Town Center Association going forward. Uh, we also noted that uh, the city would collaborate with the developer uh, and any revisions needed to buildings for the, due to the uh, Town Center design guidelines. Uh, we don't have any issues to address at this point uh, that differ from what the Town Center guidelines uh, allow, so I don't see any issues on that one. And then the final issue, the final components of the development agreement addresses uh, some city improvements, some of which were anticipated to take place as part of the lease purchase agreement, uh, and then pulled back on for the time being, others anticipated to be constructed when these two buildings were completed. Uh, so that would be the trellis, which would sit on public property and that sidewalk that sits between these two buildings. So again, looking north and east uh, the intersection leading up to the yard. Brett, if you could pull open yeah. this one, plots in the canopy design. Ah. Pull down to three. <laughs> this figure standing in the intersection east of the two buildings, building one, building one right there, left with a trellis uh, sitting in the middle. Uh, as well as the papers uh, that go underneath the trellis and then extend uh, just on the east side of building number two, north up to and just past 
the avicular entrance uh, off of Merle Hay Road, so sort of the middle of the site. <coughs> uh, so those are the two components that the city would have constructed as part of this uh, lease purchase agreement that we're currently in uh, and timed to be constructed by Hanson Real Estate uh, with the completion of these two buildings. The foundations for the trellis uh, get right up alongside the buildings. Uh, and we're also worried about uh, damage to those pavers along the timelines of those buildings being constructed. So we're wanting to delay the construction of these two elements as part of the lease purchase until these two buildings were ready to advance and be completed. Uh, so the timing works out fairly well with what we're looking at for completion of this purchase. We have to be able to incorporate those into that lease purchase agreement for the construction and complete them along the same timeline as these two commercial buildings. Uh, so that's the final two components of this. Uh, the Both of these items have not been fully priced yet. They're being priced out uh, alongside the two commercial buildings here. Uh, but we have set aside in the tentative budget for the lease purchase amount of $624,389. Honestly, hope that it'll come in lower than that, uh, but trying to build ourselves a little bit of cushion um, due to the uncertainty at the cost of that at this point. Uh, so that should that is included in our estimated total price for the lease purchase, which is currently at thirty-one point three million. Uh, that is one point seven million under the thirty-three million dollars that was budgeted for the project. Uh, we do have attached here the site plans for building one and building two. Right, you can scroll through those real quickly if you'd like. I think most folks have seen uh, building one, which has gone through P and Z and City Council previously. <laughs> Building two, which is the one that sits on Merle Hay Road, uh, kind of catty corner from that one, uh, was just submitted last week, and they'll be moving through planning and zoning here shortly. Uh, the final note of that is after the uh, consideration of the development agreement, uh, presuming approval, uh, we anticipate closing on both of these parcels uh, within the next 30 days after we finish up some legal descriptions uh, for both of them. Uh, we do have uh, Troy Hansen here in the audience if you wanted to make any comments as far as construction timelines. Uh, Thank you, Adam. Council, have any questions or comments? I, I do have one, Adam. It has to do with the um, pavers. Can you go back to the previous exhibit that showed the plan on uh, page one? I'm a little concerned about the cost of the pavers, uh, the plank pavers. I, you've probably been downtown the Court Avenue where the hub is. They have plank pavers down there. There is some maintenance issues. How do we have leeway in uh, this agreement to make some, if we had to pull back a little bit on the cost, if the costs weren't coming in like we liked, or if we weren't happy with the maintenance potential cost to maintenance. I mean, how how fixed is this pavers that we are required to do? The development stipulates that we will put in pavers and we will put in a trellis, the specifics of the design. You know, obviously, we want to work with hands to make sure it complements the building, and we want to make sure those pavers can be extended uh, throughout the rest of that frontage uh, pedestrian area as well. Uh, but I believe we'd have flexibility to determine uh, you know, what's cost appropriate and what's going to be um, I'm not against pavers. I just want to make sure that we get a good paver that and a detail that it's going to be well ma maintained. And then, um, yeah, that down over that one. Can you pull that one up? So on page one, the plan, if you zoom in on that, I mean, we've got quite a bit of, uh, it would be go up the plan. There's quite a bit of pavers across that whole uh, piece of the building two to the parking lot, and I'm I'm a little I'm a little hesitant to put that much pavers, especially where we have that entrance in off of Merle Hay Road. So I I'm just putting out now, just putting it out there that I think we need a little bit more thought about how much paving we want and the quality of it. I think the one thing we do need to take into consideration, maybe Troy can talk about this as well, is I believe these pavers will extend directly adjacent to the private property boundaries. Uh, and there are some patio spaces anticipated as part of those as well. So we'll want to make sure whatever we're using blends in with, uh, with their use. Uh, I don't know if necessarily the tables or chairs would be going out into the public space, but we do have benches and, and bicycle racks and other things of that nature. Thank you. 
and it, it, this is not the appropriate time to go into those details. I just am putting a pin in that I feel like we need to have some more clear discussion about where the pavers start and stop and what the detail is. Thank you. Adam, I have a question for you as well. Uh, this uh, regards more of the, the CAM or the common area maintenance uh, assessment. And I apologize for kind of springing this on you. I, I just want to make sure I understand the calculation that's involved. Um, th there's wording that indicates that it will be based on the square footage occupied within the applicable buildings. Is that, uh, is that categorized as uh, multi-story in the case of uh, those buildings that actually do have a second story as well? Yeah, so it would be the occupied square footage per second or in hotel third floor potentially. Okay. And and uh, you use you actually have an explicit number listed uh, in the computation as a denominator. Is it theoretically then possible that actually the occupied square footage would be greater than that denominator of 167,881 feet square feet? Sure. So for the purposes of our of this agreement, uh, referred back to our master plan, which you know conceptually shows the office building and a hotel and, and the other footprints of buildings out there, um, to be able to reach what their calculated contribution for the first three years would be. Uh, the reality is, is after those three years, that denominator, denominator will change to whatever the actual constructed square footage will be. Uh, and then the full build out will be reflective of what those actual building footprints are as well. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? I would just, uh, you know, I, I think that this, this agreement is sort of a reflection of kind of the reality of where our you know, economy is as far as especially being impacted because of COVID. And obviously the first item we had on the agenda was reflected that as well. Um, you know, we, this, we have put a lot of thought into the redevelopment of this area and the fact that we incorporated a lot of entertainment elements into it. And the fact we've got not just a city hall here, but also, um, you know, hopefully res restaurants, retail, those types of spaces as the idea being as we have events here that those type those events will draw crowds and obviously when we, we had the groundbreaking that was a perfect example of what we hope to be able to replicate and obviously a fundamental element of it is that is that cam entertainment and being able to share those costs so i i i you know not particularly excited about the fact that we are waiving those for a short period as part of this um, because to me that especially you know we 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 may have an event like we did for the grand opening when these two buildings are built, that's gonna be incredibly beneficial uh, for those businesses to really benefit from that. Um, so, um, you know, both the, both, um, I think the compromises we've made on the CAM, um, some potential compromises we've made on, on, on the TIF uh, benefit, and even the compromise we made on the, on the cost of the land, um, I wish we didn't have to make, but I also think it's there's a couple of reasons. One, obviously, to reflect the reality, but also, frankly, uh, I think we have a lot of faith in Hanson Company. The fact, you know, they're, they're a Johnson-based business. They've done a wonderful job building this city hall. They've given us um, some, uh, um, you know, site plans. One site plan that's gone all the way through the process, and another site plan that looks to be a very high-quality building, like they, like we can, ex we would always expect them to do. So, uh, because of that, I'm, I'm certainly willing to. To um, to support this tonight, but um, and I and, but I think it's important to note that we certainly hope that we're not having to waive these cam costs, or we've established some precedent here tonight that we are asked to replicate further on down the road for every project that comes here at the town center or in other parts of the community. So, fair points, and I think Benny Works will probably be knocking on the doors of the new tenants right off the bat, looking for sponsorships for. Troy, Adam offered you up. Can you give us an idea of the schedule on the uh, construction of these buildings? Sure. Good evening. Thanks for having us. And thank you for letting us be involved with this great project. Um, obviously, we're based here in Johnston and we're pretty uh, passionate about everything that we're doing here. Um, but our goal to answer your question is to hopefully start a project here in the next 30 days. As Adam said, we got to get abstracts and some minor tweaks taken care of on legal descriptions. But our intent is to move forward here with closing, be able to get dirt work, footings, and foundations going here as soon as possible. So 
right now we're shooting for 30 days. I think the Merle Hay building site plans or building plans were just submitted for, for review. So the ball's getting rolling here. And uh, aside from any kind of uh, material lead time issues, which we're experiencing with a lot of different mm. products right now, we're hoping that we can be wrapped up about this time next year. Wonderful, so wonderful. We'll be planning it after it, making an exciting project. Um, to answer your question about the CAM and the, those CAM costs, certainly our intent with this thing and the events that are happening out here are all self-supporting. Uh, nobody wants to incur those costs. Our tenants don't want to have to participate in those costs anymore. Um, it's all based on the pro rata share of, of their occupied square footage. So everybody's going to be participating in these costs. So our goal is with Venue Works and our partnership with them and making sure we're having significant activity happening out here that is self-sustaining and hopefully you know ends with a positive and we can kind of you know make some of those camp costs go away so we're all working hard and making sure these things are success and certainly allowing all of the residents to enjoy what we're putting together so Tori, we're going to, do we have a groundbreaking schedule sometime when the weather is still nice yeah no, nothing <laughs> specifically i'm sure we could probably work on coordinating that we need to do that It'll be okay. Any other questions for Troy? Thank you. We're, we, this is still a public uh, hearing on this particular item. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing then at 7.56. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-278? Move approval. If I can. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Brett, vote, please. Okay. Yes. Vote. Yes. Right. Yes. Ready? Yep. Motion passed. Moving on to item 4C, conduct a public hearing on the matter of adoption plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimate of costs for the 2021 Crescent Chase SRF sponsored project. Consider resolu resolution 21-261, adopting plan specifications, form of contract, and estimate of cost. Consideration of construction bids. Consider approval of resolution 21-262, making award of construction contract to SM Henches of Jordan, Minnesota. Consider approval of resolution 21-283, approving construction contract and bond. And we'll open this public hearing at 757. Stephen? So this uh, stormwater project is our uh, project that starts at uh, about Northwest 93rd, um, near out near Summit, um, Century Trace subdivision. Um, at that end of the project will be a constructed wetland. There'll be a series of um, check dams downstream of that and included um, bank stabilization adjacent to the Crescent, or excuse me, the Stone Point townhomes um, down near 86th Street. So it stretches a about a half mile stretch of stream channel that will be worked on in this project. Uh, this part project is partially funded through a, a state revolving loan um, sponsored project. Uh, so we did a number of SRF loans on the East of Merle Hay projects and we're able to convert what otherwise would have been interest payments into um, funding for this project. So we're estimating that we'll be getting up to $1.2 million for this project um, through the sponsored project um, <laughs> program. Um, with that came extra requirements for um, water quality management, um, which is how we ended up with the uh, uh, wetland design at the north end, or the, excuse me, the west end of this project. Um, bids were accepted on August 30th. We had six bidders. Uh, low bidder was SM Henches of Jordan, Minnesota. Would note they also have an Urbandale office. Uh, they are new um, to Johnston as far as working here, but um, are fairly well known in the metro. Um, their bid came in at one million two hundred seventy or two hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred dollars and twenty cents. That was twenty eight cent twenty eight percent below the engineer's estimate, uh, but only about eighteen thousand dollars below the second lowest bidder. So, I believe it was a competitive um, environment. Uh, Foth is the project engineer, has reviewed the, the bids and is recommending award of the contract. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for David? I don't, have, I don't have a question specifically about this project, but I think it would be helpful to give an update at some point, either at a work session, or I don't know if you guys do an annual report that summarizes kind of where we are with stormwater. But I, obviously this project, I presume, was part of when we first did the stormwater utility fee, we had a long list of, okay, these were sort of priority projects and kind of updating us, okay, 
are we, you know, are we halfway through that list or, you know, where are we from? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But maybe sort of, you know, kind of, you know, these are the ones we've kind of crossed off the list and here's some of the benefits we're seeing from them or some sort of, I think, kind of, a, so we can step back from just a, 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 this project and sort of get a sense of how, how that's working. So just kind of wanted to point that to you. I've also got a summary of the past projects, so we, I can certainly put that together as a package. Of Perfect. What we've done and what we've got coming. Great, thanks. Any other questions or comments? I, I do, Mayor. Uh, David, the uh, Thrive 2040 plan had suggested uh, that a uh, Northwest 90th be continued north all the way to 62nd at some point. Does this uh, project in any way impact uh, that provision that, that may occur? Uh, no. Um, so that section of stream is just where we'll be doing a series of check dams. And so we've located them such that they won't be impacted by the future extension uh, when that happens. So thank you. Other questions, Council? Seeing none, this is, a, this is a public hearing on this matter. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to address Council? Seeing none, we'll close this public hearing at 8.01. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-261? I move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Brett, vote, please. Vote. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready? Yep. Burkhart. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-262? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Fred, vote, please. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Vote. Yes. Motion passed. And do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21 283? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Fred, vote, please. Ready? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Vote. Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 4D, conduct public hearing and consider the following items related to the development of 21.67 acres located south of Windsor Parkway and west of Thomas Avenue. Resolution 21-263, approving amendment number two to the Johnson Thrive 2040 comprehensive plan to reclassify properties shown as business employment and high density residential to suburban residential. First reading of Ordinance 1063, amending the Johnson Revised Ordinances of 2007 by amending the official zoning map to rezone approximately 21.67 acres and adjoining right away from planned unit development, allowing uses of the PC Professional Commercial Park District to planned unit development, allowing detached single family association homes to be known as the Windsor Villas PUD. The subject property is located south of Windsor Parkway and west of Thomas Avenue. And we'll open this public hearing at, hearing at 8.03. Aaron. Thank you. Uh, Brett, could you open up the um, vicinity map? It's all the way on the left there. The IC. Uh, the subject property is on the overhead here in uh, red. Caliber, Iowa, LLC has petitioned to rezone 21.67 acres. Mm -hmm. This is south of Windsor Parkway in the Windsor Office Park to allow for construction of 82 single family detached association homes at a density not to exceed four units per acre. And uh, those units will be served by uh, private streets. And Brett, there is a um, concept as well that you could, if you could open up that up for me, that'd be great. And here's the, here's the concept here showing uh, the project in relation to the surrounding road network. Uh, this property is part of parcel D of the Windsor Office Park planned unit development. Parcel D currently allows uses of the PC Professional Commerce Park District. The future land use map for the Johnston Thrive 2040 comprehensive plan depicts the subject property as a transitional mix of business and employment uses, high density residential and medium density residential to low density residential uses. Uh, because the proposed project would eliminate the commercial land uses and the high density residential land uses in favor of low density residential only, a comprehensive plan amendment is needed in addition to the requested results. Uh, looking at adjacent uses, 
to the north opposite Windsor Parkway and west of Northwest 90th Street are the Windsor Row homes. Uh, four point, they're actually not shown on that aerial, but they would be to the west of the um, senior housing cooperative that is shown on the aerial. Uh, the Windsor Row homes are 4.22 acres um, of property zoned R3, and that, that is a uh, attached townhome product. The vintage, vintage cooperative is shown uh, to the north of Windsor Parkway here. It's 3.7 acres zoned R4. To the north opposite Windsor Parkway and east of Northwest 90th Street, again, not shown on this aerial because it's more recent development, is uh, 8951 Windsor Parkway, a set point mechanical, which is a 8,861 square foot office and warehouse building. Uh, to the immediate east of this subject property is nearly 12 undeveloped acres within the same parcel, parcel D of the Windsor Office Park PUD. And as I stated earlier, parcel D allows uses of the PC Professional Commerce Park District. South of this property are single family residential homes in the Greenwood Hills development. Those are zoned R160. And west of this property are single family residential homes in the Century Trace Planting development. Uh, buffering for this project uh, would be reviewed at a later date uh, with the site plan approval. However, a 20 foot buffer would be required between this property and the single family residential developments to the south and west. A 30 foot buffer would be required between this property and the east adjacent professional commerce park uses. And there's technically no buffer requirement between this property and the properties opposite Windsor Parkway. However, staff recommends installation of a 20 foot buffer to shield visibility of the rear of these units from the public right of way. And that's written into the PUD. Uh, for the approximately the past 20 years, our comprehensive plan um, has indicated the need for north south connectivity from Northwest Windsor Drive to the south of this property um, up to Northwest 62nd Avenue. Uh, Brett, perhaps if you could open up the um, staff report, I think there's an exhibit that uh, the top plan section that illustrates this connectivity. There's a graphic embedded in the uh, conference plan section. If you could find that, that would be useful. And again, for approximately the last 20 years, this um, the comprehensive plan has shown a, a north-south connection that would that would uh, connect Northwest Windsor Drive uh, to Northwest 62nd Avenue. And it is not the desire of the applicant to provide a through connection to Windsor Parkway, Windsor Drive uh, with this project, but staff recommends preserving the ability to accommodate the intent of the conference plan by requiring the easternmost drive in this um, development to connect to be paved to the south property line to allow for a future connection to Northwest Windsor Drive. Uh, we did have our consulting engineer examine the issue and I did include the resultant study in your staff report. Uh, the study suggests the through connection would aid traffic circulation and provide adjoining neighborhoods access to a signalized intersection, benefit fire and police response, increase pedestrian accessibility, and promote overall city mobility. Um, when this issue was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission on August 30th, um, after a, a fairly lengthy discussion, um, they voted to remove the language from um, this ordinance requiring a through connection. And that was by a vote of five yes to one no votes with one uh, commission member absent. Um, Ordinance 724 that established the Windsor Park PUD in um, 2005 stipulates provisions for pedestrian and trail access easements for both an east-west trail and a north-south trail through Windsor Office Park. And to satisfy the trail requirements, Ordinance 1063 establishing this PUD requires a 10 foot public trail be installed by the developer along the south side of Windsor Parkway and along the east side of the southward extension of Northwest 90th Street. Um, that street would be the easternmost street in this, um, in this development. Our code of ordinances requires dedication of five acres of public parkland for each 1000 residents added to the community. Based on a proposed 82 units, the developer would be responsible for providing 1.2 acres of public parkland or contributing an equal value, value alternative to be applied towards city purchase of additional parklands or to provide improvements to existing parks. 
and the developer has proposed contributing cash in lieu of its parkland dedication, in which case $34,210 would be paid at the time of final plat approval. I did send a notice of tonight's meeting to um, adjacent property owners within 320 feet of the subject property. Uh, also published a notice in the Des Moines Register. Written public comments that we have received were included with your staff report. Um, there, at the time, there were no comments received that objected to the land use, but I did receive comments both in support of a through connection to Windsor Drive and comments against the connection uh, through to Windsor Drive. I did mention earlier, but I do want to reiterate the Planning Commission vote to recommend approval remove the language requiring a through connection to Northwest Windsor Drive. And the ordinance you're considering tonight reflects that recommendation, but staff continues to recommend a through connection. And uh, do know that striking the language requiring a through connection doesn't remove the need for a north south connection and uh, as prescribed by the comp plan. Uh, so if we do not provide that north south connection today, we may be needing to revisit the issue in the future when we look at development of the east adjacent property. In other words, if we're not providing that connectivity today, we're going to have to look to provide that connectivity when the east adjacent property develops. Um, you're considering two items tonight. Resolution 21-263 that approves amendment number two to the Johnston Thrive 2040 uh, comprehensive plan and first reading of ordinance 1063. If you have any questions for me, I can answer those now. Otherwise we have uh, representatives here in the audience um, for the developer. And um, I believe there's several people in the audience who might have public comment tonight as well. <clears throat> Start with questions for Aaron. Does anyone have any questions for Aaron? I do have a question, um, and I and you might not have this <laughs> at your fingertips, but what would the buffers be um, along the south property line and the west property line if this had stayed as a um, commercial and multi residential? Uh, zoning. Would it have been a 50 foot buffer and would there be an, have been a, a substantial amount of landscape put into that buffer? Um, it would be, I believe, what did I say for the east buffer earlier tonight? I said you were telling us 20. And so we're talking, you know, the difference between the two is fairly substantial in this change. I mean, yeah, and this, this is a lower density product. Um, what had, was envisioned for this area before was multifamily housing and a mix of um, you know business and employment uses, uh, multifamily business employment transitioning down to a uh, lower density town home product along the border between the single family units and, and this property. Um, I, so yep. yeah, it would be, it's, this is a, you know, if you consider it would have been medium density before, which allows up to eight units an acre, and this is a, a four units per acre product. So it's, it's significantly less dense than what was um, envisioned by the comp plan. <clears throat> I guess what I'd like to, uh, what I'm dealing with here is the neighboring residential um, homeowners. If it were to stay commercial, they'd get a lot more uh, dense landscape buffer. Yeah, buffer yes. yeah. Than what they're going to get. But then again, you say it's, as the you say, the trade off is less density in their homes. Right. I just, I just wanted to get that out there. Okay, thank you. I think this is one of the challenges by amending a PUD. There's sort of site plan elements that we're approving that, you know, typically like a buffer or some of those things you would kind of deal with at a site plan. But we, we don't really have the details of a site plan, but we're but we're kind of locking in some things. So that does make it challenging. I mean, Aaron, I have a technical question first. So with the the action that the P and Z took, and by the way, I want to start by saying I, I I think we'd really need to give a compliment to our planning and zoning commission. Um, because when this issue was in front of the planning and zoning commission, this was a it was a it was a very challenging, it's a very complicated, there's a lot of moving parts. I thought they did a very thoughtful job in considering and reviewing a lot of different options. And so I, I wanted to start off by, by making sure that we acknowledge the, the work that the, the Planning and Zoning Commission did because they did some, uh, they put a lot of thought into their review of this. Um, so as you noted, they struck the requirement of the through street. So I think it's F1A in the, in the ordinance. 
So do we, um, do we need to, as when we approve it, do we need to make any reference to that strike or is that by them taking that action, is that in essence struck? What is presented to you tonight is I've already struck that language. Okay. So because that was their recommendation, that's how I brought it to you. So we don't have to, we don't have to offer an amendment to the- No amendments unless you feel that you would like to- To change to what, change okay. okay. Second of all, um, uh, I, I uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on your on your statement about the need for a a uh, a road a, a, um, a east connector. Or, or I, I I don't I don't I'm not sure I agree with that statement. And I know it's in the comp plan, so that's our that's our built our base building block. But um, I, I think that that um, I, I think that I don't I don't believe that there is a need for that, whether it's in this plan or some further further development. I think that that connection to the south was based on uh, you know the intended uses for Windsor Parkway as originally designed. It, the, those have evolved over time, and so I, I don't believe that there's a need for it, whether it's part of this project or a future project. So I, I, I so I just I kind of wanted to to go on the record. And, and you did actually ask me for some additional exhibits today that weren't included with the uh, staff report, and I, I forwarded that to you by email. But yeah, uh, perhaps if you could. It's actually if you look at I think. Uh, I don't know. I think you got two of them up there. Maybe yeah. That was, on the last one. That was the model. Model. I think there was. Uh, can you go down one this so we can see? Yeah, maybe choose that one. Okay, and then so this this gives a, a better overall view of connectivity in in the neighborhoods. And uh, yes, it's it's not the cleanest. It, um, kind of working on short notice to get that put together, but it overlays the concept. Um, on the on the aerial to show you um, how these streets would would interact with the adjacent street system. I think with you know Northwest Windsor Drive and gosh I've forgotten the name of the street to the south of that uh, Timberwood Drive, both currently you know terminate in a, in a dead end. And of course when that um, property adjacent to those um, dead ends develops, there will be either cul-de-sacs or a, a loop connection. Um, that's yet to be determined it's based on um the developer what they what they are able to engineer and present to the city council um but i think you know in, in order to get back to northwest 86th street um this connection from windsor drive up to windsor parkway provides a little more through connectivity yeah and i guess the reason i push back on it is i from what i've heard from the residents who live in all those residential areas south of of this is that they aren't seeking a way to get to 86th Street. Now, I, I will tell you, I, 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 you know, if you're on Oak Brook or, or Oak, I'm not sure those the streets, um, the that is that it can, goes. If you're going, uh, if you're trying to turn north on 86th Street from one of those streets that connects there, it's very challenging. But that said, most people find a way. They can either go west to 93rd or they can go down. Um, they can get down to 54th and, and, and access. That is what I've heard from residents. I've not heard this need or desire. In fact, what I hear from them is they're concerned that traffic from Jethro's and the businesses are now going to come from those and, and, and use, use the connector to, and go through their neighborhood. And that's their significant concern. So they really don't view it as them going up to 86th Street as this is now an opportunity to allow traffic to come back the other way. And our recommendation was based on the comprehensive plan. Exactly. The engineering it, study. Yep. No, I, I, I mean, I, I realize the traffic study shows that, the, in, the comp plan shows that, I realize our public safety folks yeah. feel that there's a benefit for that, but, I, but I, I think it's important to note, I'm not, from what I'm hearing from the residents who live down there, and I'm sure other members of the council have heard as well, that that, that is not something that they really feel a need for. And I think they've got a pretty compelling case that, that there is not a need for that connector. Other questions or comments for Aaron from the council? Aaron, in one of those drawings, would you mind uh, kind of uh, illuminating uh, where the trails would go? I, I am incredibly thrilled, as I know many folks are, for the south side of Windsor. That one's easy for us to follow, but as specified uh, for a north-south um, indicator, has that now been taken off? It actually hasn't. I tried to make that clarification. I know you had asked um, as a follow-up question to the yes. Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, you had asked of us what were the exact changes they made. Um, I went back and, and um, looked at the minutes 
And uh, initially I was under the impression that they had removed both the requirement to um, provide a through road connection or to accommodate a future through road connection, but also to remove the north south trail component. They did not remove the north south trail component. They only removed the requirement to provide a, for a or accommodate a future through road connection. Um, so as this ordinance that you are looking at tonight stands, um, they would be required to uh, provide a, a paved trail on the south side of uh, Windsor Parkway um, from the west end of this development to the east end of this development and a public trail from the south property line to the north property line, unless you strike that language as well. But we don't have an exhibit that actually indicates that uh, north-south trail? Uh, that trail is not shown on their um, concept. Basically, it would just be a requirement in the PUD that when they come back with the site plan, it would need to be shown on the okay. site plan being constructed. <clears throat> Thanks, Aaron. Other questions for Aaron? If there are no more for me, it might be appropriate at this time to turn it over to the applicant. Let's do that. Thank you, <clears throat> honorable mayor, members of the council. Dean Rogier with CDA. <clears throat> Sir, I've got lost my voice today. Here on behalf of Calibre, Iowa, Justin Washburn and Justin Bauer with Clarity Homes. Um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish here, the transition of land use from the single family to the commercial. Very nice product, very high demand for this product right now. These guys are building these homes all over the metro. Detached single family housing, very nice product. Um, just to cut to the chase, the, the, the two things that You've mentioned are the two things that we wanted to talk about. That the three street is something we definitely don't want with this project. Uh, it's not needed. It is a uh, concern of a cut through traffic from the commercial areas was mentioned. And this, these communities that, that these guys build are um, they're, they're an intimate setting where they, they prefer quieter areas with. Uh, traffic um, in these developments and <clears throat> that's how all of their developments have, have come together so far the the trail part is not as concerning as, as a cut through street would be but just looking at the map and the aerial windsor parkway kind of angles to the southeast as you're getting closer to the park along 86 we just thought it made more sense to have the trail closer to where 86 is and where the park is. Not have to cut through the single family area to the south of us. So those are those are basically the, the, the things we wanted to talk through. And, um, there's also more trees to the south of us. So it'd be probably less tree clearing if, if the trail connection was, was to the east instead of where the 90th street Connection is shown through our site, fewer driveways to cross, et cetera. So that's just something we'd like you to consider. If you have any questions, questions about their product or anything else. You know, I'm having a difficult time understanding where the trail would be. Could you just walk up to the map and show us? This would be along the street. So That's what's proposed. Private drive. Yeah, right now we're showing a, a five foot sidewalk along the street and we're, we're okay with a pedestrian connection. That's no problem. The, the, the 10 foot path on Windsor Parkway is along the south side. And what the staff report says right now is recommending the, the 10 foot trail also run to the south um, into the Greenwood Hills neighborhood down here. And then ultimately down into the green belt. And, we're just recommending that as this moves further south, you're getting closer to where the green belt and everything is down here at the park. So we thought it made more sense to, to connect that further east. But again, that's, <clears throat> we've got a, a number of driveways along here too. So there's probably gonna be a, a simpler connection as you get further east. <laughs> Is
Any other questions? Couldn't that 10 foot trail be behind those uh, townhomes that line that street? Um, <clears throat> I'm not talking very loud tonight. It, <clears throat> it could be, but it, that's where that's where we're going to do all of our bucket plane things. And we had a 10 foot there. We'd also have a five foot along the street. So we basically have a sidewalk on both sides then. So we prefer just to keep that, that east area landscape nice up against the future office product to, to the east of us. I, I am of the opinion, and, and I know where this is sort of we're still in the questioning period that I don't I don't I don't know feel like we are in my mind that the, the uh, north south trail is is needed there or that that's the right spot for it. And so I when when it comes time to consideration of the PUD, I'm going to recommend striking the requirement for the north south trail and leaving that issue to to the to the site plan. I'm not saying that we wouldn't have a trail, a north south trail there, but I don't, but it, but it may not end up on this property. And I, I'm concerned if we leave it in the PUD, then that, that makes it a little bit harder. Um, I think that, I think that when we get to the site plan and then also potentially maybe when the site plan comes along for the, for the land that's the undeveloped land that's south of this, south and, and east that we can then figure out the right trail routing. And also I think even to figure out, I think we need to give some real thought to whether um, we need a trail that goes here or if, it, or if it's just, if, it, if we have a trail that runs all the way along the south side of Windsor um, and then people can can access the Greenbelt Trail from 86th Street. Um, so um, I think it's a little, I think, I don't, I don't think it's necessary to have it in the PUD. So when we get to that point, I'm gonna make a recommendation that we strike that um, this north-south trail requirement from the PUD. Councilman Cope, I tend to agree with that because I, what I'm struggling with tonight is I can't see how this all fits into the rest of the trail system. Right. Yeah. I mean, but it, it is, that's why I, that's one reason I asked Adam to get or Aaron to give us a little bit wider view. Right. Because yeah. it and part of it too is until that development that comes into the south, until we see that site plan and how that. It, it's in, it, it's just, there's just a lot of question marks about that. Um, and so, it, it, you know. I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the argument that there's a lot of driveways along there. I mean, yeah. what we don't want to have happen is have a, a trail going along where, you know, every you know, 20 right. feet you have a driveway. Right, right, right. That's, so it's kind of a, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, I, I, it's in, I think it's in the comp plan or it's in the, it was in the original, it was in the original PUD. So it's kind of holding over from that original PUD. And I, I think it just doesn't fit. We need to give some more thought to that, but that, there's nothing wrong with that, so. Aaron, any problem with removing it from here and addressing it in the site plan? No, the conflict with the driveways is a good point. If we're not requiring a through street connection, you know, it might be best to echo a trail connection where we do require that through street connection. But the idea, yeah, was to get um, trail traffic from the Green Belt, Belt Trail up north. To right, the right, and there might, be, there might be a way to do that, but. This probably isn't. That, that, that was Tom was referring to is a, uh, in my numbering convention might need to be worked over, but it was three EA that requires the uh, trail connection. Aaron evidently didn't take my hint that uh, that the commitment to a through street was uh, questionable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can agree. <laughs> Any other questions for Aaron or the developer? If not, this is a public hearing on this item. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the council? Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Paul James, 8700 Windsor Parkway, Mayor, Council. Paul, I've talked to you a lot. I don't know that I've ever met you. Uh, a couple times. Okay, very good. <laughs> so I grew up um, farming this ground. And we had red English cows when this street was all pioneer across the street. So we've um, been excited to see the city kind of come out and grow around and it's a great opportunity. We've been trying to sell this property uh, as office ground for 20 years. And Doug Zeeberg's done a really masterful job for us in trying to find a creative uh, project. We were thrilled when we got off the zoning. We thought we'd struck gold. And uh, 20 years later, <laughs> Uh, my mother lives just um, east of this development. She's excited to see 
a low density private, you know, a very uh, um, wonderful little neighborhood. It's going to be peaceful, and uh, and we're we we've economically kept, kept hitting barriers. One, the market just really didn't want to fill an office like everyone's plans. And then secondly, the street um, kept putting, you know, imposing certain costs. Those costs have risen over 20 years. When we agreed to, to the concept 20 years ago, I priced the road and I thought I could, you know, make it work with office funding back then. We're a long way from that type of sale. So the, 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 the concept of a three street is really on the platter tonight. If we think we can just kick that down the road to my uh, unsold ground to the east, I want to clarify that. If, if we need a road, this deal is done and we'll be raising uh, soybeans. No problem. We'll, I mean, Doug will continue to find us office and we'll, just, we'll keep working that. I mean, we're happy to, to see that goal. And we accept that there might be a need to have a through street. We'll deal with that down the road. But if you do change the complex, you change the permitted use, that means that the through street will not go to Windsor Parkland. Not, not to the east. And so that's really what I'd like everyone to be, you know, just to state clearly as the owner of the east, um, I'd rather leave it as is. Or we all agree that the Three Street maybe isn't the best for this development, the community of the South, and for the best use, highest use of the ground. So I, I hope that uh, they're successful. I think it's going to be a really great addition to Johnson. So, Mr. Jennings, I just want to make sure I understand what you your your suggestion are is either the street the the, the requirement that the Three Street be continued and to be on this north south street, or that there be no requirement for a through street? Uh, if this plat is, is adopted, then I, I, there is no, there's, my understanding is those not going to be a through street. Right. And, 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 and I want to make it clear that I, because uh, the other alternative is there'd be a through street and it would be further east on your property, your remaining property, which obviously you don't want that either. Right. And I guess that's what I've been trying to say all along tonight is I don't believe there is a need for a through street either on this property or on the further east property. Would you agree with that or not? Okay. I just want to make sure it was okay. I, I, I live in Washington state. So I come back on an occasional basis. I used to check up with my mom and I walk all these, these uh, streets and the beautiful trails. I think this is Johnson's an amazing community. I love it. And I, I love the streets. And one of the nice things about it is just how tranquil it is. And that three street, um, I think, would disrupt that tranquility. I live just on the other side of 86th Street, and so I walk all over there all the time, too. And that's, I mean, I, so I'm, I'm in agreement with that, too. So, But it's, it, it seems like staff is, like, you know, kind of, they've seen it. And I can see, you know, you see something for 20 years, and kind of go, oh, it's real. And you, you become attached. And I do respect the fact that um, it could impact response rates for emergency vehicles. To, uh, I, I get that. But I also think that what's being proposed makes a lot of sense is that you pull a pipe out of this you know, widened walkway and emergency vehicles can transition if need be into that street to the south. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. State your name and address for the record, please. Yes, the real Dennis. I live in 1920 Northwest Windsor Drive, right at the dead end of the Northwest Windsor Drive. I just wanted to also uh, express the support for not to have any extension of any kind and just leave everything as is, especially keeping the trees out there, especially there's like wildlife habitat. We have like an owl living there. As far as I know, they're protected. So just wanted to express that. So it was a little bit too technical. All of that was a little bit technical. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, ordinance striking, not striking. I don't, I don't get that. I'm just basically expressing I would like to have no connection of any kind, no extension. 
plenty of time. But not plenty of time. I think that's the direction we're going. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claire Matten at 9118 Northwest Windsor Drive. And I just want to concur with everyone who has expressed uh, no through street for Windsor Drive and particularly no through street is needed from our neighborhoods through to Windsor Parkway or 62nd. I mean, the scary thing I heard tonight is they think that the Windsor Drive is supposed to go all the way to 62nd. That, that isn't on any of the 40, 40, 2040 plan or any plan I've ever seen. Um, and we've lived for 20 years without this. We get in and out of the neighborhood just fine. Um, and so we really do not want the street to go through. And I, I read the FOSS traffic study and I didn't read it to, to say that there was any necessity for this street to go through um, other than maybe some redundancy for emergency vehicles, which would be offered from what's being proposed. We too like our quiet, tranquil neighborhood and think that it should stay that way with cul-de-sacs, um, just like several other neighborhoods, many other neighborhoods in the Johnston area that keep it um, private and, and tranquil. And I, I don't know how many people have uh, sent in their public comments, um, but I know there's uh, eight uh, people who live on Windsor Drive or one of these streets that I've personally talked to who have also said that they do not want the street to go through, so. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to address the council on this item? Well, I'm Kathy Blau and I live at 9117 Northwest Windsor Drive. I've lived there for 20 years and I moved here from South Dakota. And I remember falling in love with the neighborhood. It was tranquil, it's low density, you get to know your neighbors. And I just don't see a need for a through street to our Northwest Windsor Drive. I mean, we, we don't have any complaints about the police or they always seem to, you know, get there if we ever have trouble in ambulance. So I, I don't agree with that study that was done saying that that's a necessity, but also something that really caught my attention tonight is you talked about spending $50 million for trails and, you know, to improve our quality of life. And right here in Windsor Drive, we have that and we don't have to spend anything to keep it. It'll cost us to lose it. And I think that's something that we should consider. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? I will. Did your name and address for the record, please? There are. Maybe can I defer to have her speak first and then I speak after? Would you prefer me to speak first? Well, we'd like to take the people in the audience first, but um, she or she's if, your engineer. Yeah. So she's the engineer. She'd be the technical person. Okay. Okay. With that? that would be fine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Melissa Hills. Uh, I'm with Civil Engineering Consultants, 2486th Street in Urbandale. And I'm uh, representing Clarkson Land Company that owns the undeveloped parcel uh, to the south of this and uh, has developed the Greenwood Hills area. Um, we've looked at several different layouts for this uh, this remnant parcel we have. And uh, the best layouts uh, in terms of number of units that we can get uh, comes with doing a through street connection. That being said, I understand that the residents are not in favor of that, uh, but we feel it's important uh, to have that connectivity for 
for fire and safety. Um, we also feel like uh, we need we need you to be aware of the fact that this this remnant parcel of the Clarksons does not have sanitary sewer access. That that sanitary sewer access was cut off when the park was developed down south. We no longer have access to the sanitary sewer on 86th Street to serve this piece. So we want to make sure that when the piece east of this uh, develops, that there's a sanitary sewer that's deep enough to serve the extension of Timberwood Drive. Um, currently, if you look at connecting a sewer through this piece we're looking at tonight, um, it would not be deep, deep enough to get to the Timberwood lots. Um, so whether or not there's a street connection or, or there definitely needs to be a sanitary sewer connection and probably water main looping if you want uh, better water pressure. Uh, but those are just some of the things that we're concerned about with Randy's piece. And, and we can, you know, if we terminate our streets, we end up with less lots if we terminate the streets in cul-de-sacs. Um, so it's, it's something to consider. Do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for Melissa? I'm not seeing any, Melissa. Thank you. My name is Randy Clarkson. I live at 7051 Forest Drive and uh, own the grounds uh, figures to that south in the Greenwood Hills area. Um, so we don't lose focus of why we're here tonight. Um, I don't have any objections to this project. I think the people doing the project are reputable. I think they'll put the best foot forward. I think they'll do a good job. I think it's good for the ground. I think it's good for the city of Johnson. There's a lot of things I think that are positive about it. I don't have any problems with that. Um, might be a little hard of a pill to swallow when you think of the comprehensive plan uh, as uh, indicated that street will go through on, on Windsor. Uh, Foth really comes down the side if it should continue. Staff, I think, is recommending it should continue. And so um, all of us have different opinions here why we think it's not a good idea, but the, the experts that have looked at it in the past uh, think that it that it is. Um, I've thought that the proposal to put a public street to the east side of their property was a ridiculous idea. I, I mean, it's a private uh, community and I think that's a very terrible idea. Faced with this and the uncertainty of what happens on the street, uh, it almost, can you put the uh, yeah. overall view again that you had the first time? Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, that leaves us in our development really nowhere to go. Uh, the property uh, cuts into where the proposed Windsor driveway would, uh, parkway would be. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where a temporary emergency road would interact there. I'm not sure where a bike path would come through. Um, as is there, it forces me to put in some infrastructure and streets that I really wasn't anticipating or basically promised that I'd have to put in. So I have a little problem with that. Um, you know, they say uh, uh, it's in the eyes of the beholder when you think of anything. We've heard a lot of people here say, well, I don't want that road to go through on Windsor. And you know, I, in a great world, if we could all live on 10 acres and there's wildlife and trees and no traffic, I think we'd all like to do that. I think there probably would be as many or at least a certain number of people that live on Long Meadow and Highland Oaks Drive that their cars go by them every day and it's more traffic because there's not another access to the north. Now, when they uh, put in the retaining wall on Long Meadow, which is the southernmost street coming out of Greenwood Hills, 
I don't even, I'm not sure it's even a 90 degree angle. It's very difficult to see coming out of there and it's almost dangerous. So from my way of thinking, the less people that go that way, maybe the better. It has ha helped that the street to the north now goes through and it, it takes a little of that off. So um, it's good for some people. It may not be good for others. Um, I'm just saying that I think we need to, to look at this a little bit more. I'm basically for their project. I think it's a great project. It just feels that uh, it, it really ties my hands if they want me to put in a loop street. You know, I think we lose two to three lots or something like that and something that certainly wasn't expected or indicated or probably promised. So I think that's my comments. Any questions? Mr. Clarkson, you've alluded twice to using the term promise. It was, was that promised well, if by you, whom? If you want to check the notes of the Planning Zoning Commission, someone from the audience made that statement. So I would just refer you to, to look at that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Clarkson? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Justin Washburn with Caliber, Iowa, uh, 720 South 68th Street in West Des Moines. Um, Aaron, do you have this concept that we gave that we intended to work? That's nice. Um, I guess I just wanted to address just a couple items. There's, there's been a question um, with regards to where the uh, how that connectivity that we were asked to be creative with um, as far as an alternate uh, connection for emergencies, if there was a need um, for some form of alternate connectivity. And um, the way that we've proposed that alternate connectivity is a beefed up 10 foot wide trail um, from the end of our property to the south if and when um, Mr. Clarkson would, would develop his property to the south. And, and, I, and I, I appreciate uh, Randy's compliments, um, and it, it is it, this is a tough spot, you know, for us to be in. I, I have a lot of respect for for Mr. Clarkson and all that he's done in the community as well. And um, but uh, uh, we're we're planning to do something now, and unfortunately, you know, the ground to the south, there's there isn't plans brought forth to figure that out. And this is the alternate that we that we would provide, and so that's where that connectivity would be. Um, and I think that. As far as uh, uh, the question of if there is folks in these neighborhoods that um, would rather see the road go through, um, I guess this is their opportunity to, to come forth and, and express that they would like it to. And, and um, at this moment, they haven't done that, you know. So I, I think that we are hearing from the community and the neighbors that, that there is not really a desire for the road, roadway to be connected through. So. Um, we're very excited about this area, excited about the project, um, excited to be working on something in the city of Johnston and also with the Jennings family and, and trying to move this property forward. And EPCON has an extremely uh, good reputation throughout the entire community um, with regards to the housing and, and uh, opportunities that are going to allow for those folks to move into these um, homes. And, and uh, so, yeah, I guess that's just a couple of things that I wanted to bring up because there was a question on that extension. And the connection that you're showing there, that's a bike path that would help me understand. Explain that again. So it would be it would be ran and paved to the property line. So if there was an if there was a in essence, a emergency where uh, for some reason uh, police or, or EMS personnel or something could not get to the north somehow because there's, I don't know, but that would be the future opportunity for them to cut through our property um, to get to gain access to the south. So, and, and the, the, I mean, I think the hard, I mean, to me, as I look at your property, your proposal, and maybe it, 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 this is helpful to have up, but also it's helpful to maybe pull up the full layout of your project. Is, yeah, I mean, this is really the one that I was hoping that we could show. Like, well, I, you know, I just want to make a point of clarification that, that that's not part, any part of the DUD. Uh, right. So if, if you right. are concerned about emergency access, you might choose to employ this as an alternative is what he's saying. And to me, that's, again, that's sort and of a that, site plan issue. That because, would concede that, right. that 
perhaps there is an issue where through connectivity is needed, in my opinion. If, well, we were, if we were to start going down this route, then it concedes. I would put $100 down <laughs> that no fire truck or police vehicle would access this property using that, as opposed to the two. Because we were asked to give an alternate. Exactly. No, I understand. I, that's, all, that's the reason we did it. I mean, you have you have full access, two accesses on this property, two access sites from Windsor Parkway, and you can access Windsor Parkway from 86th Street or 93rd Street or 94th or whatever it is. That's how emergency vehicles are going to access your property. Not, I mean, not coming through all the neighborhoods, which are narrow streets. I, I get lost over this part of town all the time because the roads go this way, not like this. And so it, this, I, this, I, this is sort of, I, this is a head scratcher for me. So again, I don't, and, I, and I'm glad to know it's not part of the PUD. And I realize I mean, we need to have a plan for public safety and, 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 and take that into account. I just don't ever see them using, accessing the property, this property from that south and east off of Windsor Drive um, it, it's just, it's it's just a, it's a real to me. That's why I I really think that there's plenty of access to this property from from Windsor Parkway, and we don't need to to try to figure this out. Is there anyone else? Ninety one oh six Northwest Windsor Drive on the fourth property there. In 2019, I had an ambulance at my house. Very good response time getting there. And I would imagine they came from 62nd down 94th to 93rd and right into Windsor with no problem. So just wanted to say that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing then at 8.52. Typically what we do is I will call up each of the items and ask for a motion, but I think that in this situation, why don't we uh, see if there's any discussion generally, and then I'll call up the items. Does council wanna make any comments? Well, at this point, I discussion? think there's a lot of discussion for plus and minuses here. <clears throat> I think I like the staff to do much more, little bit of research on this, and I come back to us again on this. So until that point, I'd like to just that we table this for a while. Is that a motion to table? Yes. Is there a second? I'm not hearing a second. So the motion fails. I do have a comment, Mayor. Okay. This is really a tough decision. Um, and I really appreciate Mr. Clarkson's points that he made about his property. Um, I hadn't thought about that before. So thank you for bringing that. And I'm still not 100% sure where I'm going to go, but I will make this comment that when we do see this plat come back to us for approval, um, that I'm going to be very uh, picky or I'm going to push caliper in terms of the buffers along the existing residential areas. I think people that uh, bought houses expecting that they might be backed up to an office park, which is, you know, Monday through Friday, weekends are quieter. Now there's going to be lots of homes, lots of barbecues all the time. You know, So I'm going to say to you guys that if you could save existing trees along that property line or in, you know, go a step further in terms of landscaping that because they're going from a 50-foot buffer down to a 20-foot buffer. And I think we talk about how residential is less dense. But when you talk about office park, I mean, that's almost kind of nice to have an office park near where you're going to be because you can like, oh, yeah, we got parking right over there. You can walk through the backyard. So that's what I'm saying to you. I'd like to see when you bring this to us. I'm going to be looking for landscape. And that's all I have for a comment right now. 
I'd first like to uh, thank uh, everyone for the civil dialogue and for sharing their thoughts and opinions uh, on it, uh, and uh, especially the neighbors for uh, coming out to be able to share what is and what we hope will continue to be a peaceful and calm street. I also though, do want to stress and I must remind the council because it was a very vivid night for me. I took uh, my oath and sat down at the seat later that evening. Uh, you were approached by this developer in a work session prior to me being seated. And at that point, they came forward with a much, much higher density uh, residential proposal. I think that this developer has listened to market needs I think they have tried to weigh in and respond to city and staff requests. I think they have tried to reach out uh, actively to neighbors, but also to, to realize that they too are now a neighbor if they purchased this property and wanted to make a product that could better fit in with those around them. I think they're doing their best. And uh, I think to some extent, we could have it far, far worse. And to that, I certainly thank them and thank everybody and certainly want to make sure that that uh, Windsor Drive does not go through. I, I think, you know, so as, as we look at the, the, what we have in front of us, so the ordinance number 1063, I think the two most significant issues are obviously the, um, the issue of the street connect, connectivity. Um, and I, from my perspective, the Planning and Zoning Commission has addressed that issue, and I'm satisfied with the way they've addressed it um, by striking that requirement. And so um, uh, I, I think we can, I'm comfortable moving forward with that. And I think, Mr. Clarkson, you make some, some really good points that you shouldn't have to, to have burdens now shifted to you on your, when, when you eventually, at some point, whenever you come forward, and I your engineer, I heard her when she made her presentation before to the planning and zoning. I listened to that meeting via Zoom. Um, and and, um, uh, and um, so I, I've reviewed and looked through some of those different proposals that you've made. And I think we can certainly try to take that the impact of this on your project and certainly the, as well on figuring out the uh, uh, sanitary sewer. And hopefully we can get some resolution, whether it's with the Jennings owners or, or with Caliper to get that resolved, because I think we certainly need to figure that out. Um, but I, I think at this point, and, and this is, this is a, you know, anytime you're trying to amend a PUD or you've got, you're trying to do a PUD, I mentioned this earlier, it's, it's, it's hard from a city council standpoint, because there's elements of this that you normally would deal with at the, um, at the site plan, like, like buffers and street routing and trails. And, um, and so, and you have very specific detail. I mean, you have these drawings from these engineering firms that give you exactly down to the foot where a trail would be and where, the, how wide the streets would be and all that. And we don't have that in front of us at the PUD. So that makes it kind of challenging. So we're trying to establish um, very specific buffer requirements and very specific trail requirements and very specific tree requ street requirements and, and without having a lot of detail. Um, so at this point, uh, when we get to the time to, to, to make a motion on, on ordinance 1063, I'm, I'm going to also move to remove, there's, it's in sub, subsection E, sidewalks and trails. I'm going to ask to have the, in the, the second line, it says, and along the east side of the southward extension of 90th Street. So that's the, that's the north-south trail on the east side of the property. I'm going to have that, I'm going to ask that that be removed from the PUD requirement with the expectation that we will revisit that issue. And there may end up being a trail along right exactly where it's proposed today. Um, but, I, but to me, I think we, we need, that's not a decision to make tonight. That's a decision to make when the, the site plan comes back from your project. And maybe at some point we'll have a site plan from Mr. Clarkson's project as well. And we can kind of figure out, A, do we need a trail in this area and B, the right routing for it. Um, I just don't think we're ready to do that on, on that issue. The one thing I'm prepared to say tonight is I do not believe, um, despite the fact that it's, it's, it was in the comp plan, the, the 2030 comp plan, and it was in, in the comp plan when we updated it, the through street requirement, despite the fact that our, our, our city engineer recommends that it, there be a through street, and despite, and I even know folks from uh, both uh, the police department and the fire department would like to see that, I just, I just don't believe that there is a need for a connectivity street through street as part of this development or any any 
um, development uh, in Windsor. And so I, as long as I'm on the council, I don't intend to support that. Um, and so wanna make that as clear as possible. I think there's been some good discussion this evening and, and much of it I, I, I too agree with. I think this is a good example of the way the process is supposed to work. A developer, come, developer comes forward with a proposal, neighbors are notified, there's an opportunity to, to raise concerns, concessions are made, compromises are made, and at the end, maybe not everybody is 100% happy with, uh, with the result, but I think that you know, we get the best product, uh, the best result um, that we can because, because everybody's involved and, and, uh, and that uh, dialogue has taken place. Uh, Mr. Clarkson, um, I, I agree with what uh, Councilman Cope here has said, you, you've raised some good issues tonight. Um, we need to make sure that you do have uh, sanitary sewer and, and uh, water when, when your property develops. I think the sooner you can start having those conversations with city staff and even with um, this developer, probably the better so we can figure out how it all works together. You know, we have a proposal for, before us tonight. They're ready to, to move forward with their um, development. We can't, we can't hold it up because because we don't know yet what, what you intend to do with your property. But we want, we, we want to keep that in mind and we want to make sure that you're able to develop your property as well. So with that, we'll go through the uh, items here. Do we have a motion to approve resolution number 21-263? So that, that's the amendment to the comp plan. Yes. And that doesn't that doesn't in, in, implicate any of these details that we just have talked no, about. It's, uh, it approves a lower density in the okay. plan. It's a commercial uh, business, a higher residential plan. Uh, higher residential density, and the amendment would accept a lower density. I'll move approval of uh, resolution twenty one dash two six three. Second. We have a motion and a second discussion. Brett, vote please. Oh. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready. Yes. Burkhardt. Yes. Motion passed. Do we have a motion to appro approve first reading of ordinance number 1063? I'll make a motion and I'm also going to, um, to move to amend ordinance 1063 section E paragraph one to remove from the second line of that paragraph, the words, and along the east side of the southward extension of Northwest 90th Street, that language removes the trail, the, the north-south trail on the east side. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Brett, vote, please. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Vote? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item 4E, conduct public hearing and consider first reading of ordinance number 1062, amending the Johnston revised ordinances of 2007 by amending the official zoning map to rezone approximately 31.59 acres. Thanks everyone for coming this evening. It looks like the entire crowd is leaving, <laughs> leaving us now. Oh, yeah, put money in the meter. <laughs> Tell my family also. <laughs> Three zone approximately 31.59 acres located west of Merle Hay Road and the future westward extension of Northwest Johnson Drive to plan unit development district to be known as the Ignite Recreation Complex and Johnson Gateway Park PUD. And we'll open this public hearing at 9.03. Aaron? Uh, Ignite Johnston LLC has requested this rezoning to allow for the development of a 208,000 square foot recreation facility that will house an indoor track, field house, classrooms, meeting space, and multi-purpose courts, in addition to outdoor sports fields and volleyball courts. Uh, this project is a public-private partnership with the city of Johnston that will include infrastructure improvements, including the extension of Johnston Drive and construction of a city park and regional stormwater detention basin. And at some point, the uh, that should finish loading. <laughs> <laughs> Use your imagination. The uh, Johnston Thrive 2040 Comprehensive Plan designates the subject properties as a mix of commercial and parks and open space. And this proposed use conforms with the vision of the Thrive 2040 Plan. Uh, if we look at the surrounding land uses, which we can do while that's still loading, um, the no north of this subject property is ChildServe. 
and also Outlot 8 of Crown Point Plat 1. That's a vacant parcel of land that was deeded to the city by Green Meadows in the year 2000. North of Outlot 8 are Meadow Park townhomes and Terrace Ridge condominiums, which are um, PUDs allowing R3 uses, which is a medium density residential classification. East of the Ignite property are multiple properties fronting Roll Hay Road, zoned C3 Highway Service Commercial District, and those are occupied by restaurant and auto sales uses. South of this property is Lithia Volkswagen, zoned C3. And west of this property is the Beaver Creek floodplain. And of course, on the other side of Beaver Creek is the city of Urbandale. The proposed uses, now that all the parcels have pulled up, um, looking at parcels A and B, um, they allow uses of the C2 Community Retail Commercial District. In addition, supplemental uses to include an indoor sports and recreation complex, including a field house and gymnasium. Uses and activities may include running track, soccer field, multi-purpose sports courts, locker rooms and weight and athletic training facilities, office facilities for support staff, sales of sporting equipment and accessories, and food and drink concession stands or cafeterias. Other uses may be allowed by determination of the zoning administrator. Um, outdoor participant sports and recreation activities, which might include volleyball and tennis sports, baseball, t-ball, softball fields, soccer, football, or other athletic fields. And also on parcels A and B, other events that might include indoor and outdoor concerts, fairs, and festivals. If we look at parcel C, um, that would be the location of a municipal park. Uses might include any of the aforementioned outdoor participant sport activities or other uses typically associated with a municipal park. Parcel D is primarily designated for parking. Allowed uses of parcel E uh, would be that's designated for regional stormwater treatment and detention. Um, accessory uses for all, all parcels would include outbuildings for concession stand, like a concession stand, grounds maintenance, equipment storage, restroom facilities, uh, dugouts for the ball fields, uh, sports cages, and, and shelters. Our code of ordinances um, under Chapter 166.33 addresses off street parking, and the code does not contain a similar use category to park, calculate a parking requirement for this proposed use. Um, but Ignite has provided us with some empirical evidence um, from um, existing facilities that they operate um, that show they would need to park as many as 300 vehicles in the, in the morning or the, during the daytime and as many as 500 vehicles in the evening hours. And special events might have a greater parking demand. The PUD master plan provides 482 parking spaces. Um, that would be sufficient parking for the estimated maximum uh, evening parking demand. In the instance of a special event, which creates a greater parking need, um, Ignite intends to explore opportunities to partner with the city, uh, perhaps to shuttle participants from additional parking spaces available at remote sites, so for instance, Crown Point and Terra Park. Um, if the rezoning is approved, those parking demands will continue to be evaluated um, through the site plan review process. Building materials allowed in the PUD. Um, if you would, Brett, there should be exterior renderings. Let's open uh, open the staff report. And let's page down and take some pretty pictures of the building. Should be down below quite a ways. <clears throat> Right there, Steam, I think. These are some of the initial renderings for the facility. Of course, um, those uh, building elevations would be approved with the site plan review process, but building materials that are addressed um, in the PUD include precast concrete panels, architectural block, metal wall or roof panels, and glass for a translucent curtain wall. Of course, due to the size um, and architectural constraints posed by the field house, fabric or membrane construction methods uh, would be necessary. With regard to open space and landscaping requirements, those would be calculated according to our existing code language. However, I put some language in the PUD that excludes outdoor recreation fields and regional stormwater treatment facilities. 
uh, from the total site area when we compute the open space and open space landscaping requirements. And the reason, of course, is because you can't plant a tree in the middle of a ball field. <clears throat> With regard to buffering, no buffering is required between the subject property and adjacent C3 uses. Those would be the uh, properties to the east. Any necessary buffering between this site and the north adjacent housing would be reviewed with the preliminary plat and site plan approval. I did mail a notice to owners within 320 feet of the site. And again, a notice was placed in the Des Moines Register uh, that advertised tonight's hearing. I did include any written public comments that I received with the staff report. Um, we did have some uh, adjacent residents attend the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting and their comments were recorded in the meeting minutes that were included as an attachment to your staff report. Uh, most of the concerns were related to noise and lighting. And uh, of course, the lighting would be reviewed with the site plan. Um, with regard to noise, our existing code provides some enforcement provisions for noise disturbances related to construction noise and noise from musical instruments or sound equipment. And that's as measured at the boundary of residential property. Um, it would be uh, such noises would be um, prohibited between the hours of 6.30 a, or excuse me, between 9 p.m. and 6.30 a.m. Uh, when it comes to crowd and spectator noise, um, say if there's an outdoor sporting event, uh, there would be, um, of course, cheering, shouting, and those activities would be on par with other outdoor private league sports and school sports activities that occur in the city of Johnston, such as uh, the football stadium or track, uh, the soccer complex or, or uh, baseball and softball events that occur at the Lou Clarkson Park. Um, but there are provisions for exempting those activities from, from provisions of the noise ordinance in our existing code. Before turning it over to the applicant, I want to circle back and talk briefly about signage. Uh, the PUD language does relax some of the sign regulations of the city code of ordinances. Uh, specifically, we've allowed for a slightly greater portion of building area be allowed when we calculate the allowed size of a wall sign. And the number of activities that are occurring on the site um, would actually make it necessary for um, placement of more directional signs throughout the parking lot. We were guiding people to various different, you know, uh, municipal park this direction, um, outdoor fields this direction, concession, restroom. So um, that would necessitate the need for additional directional signs. So I've relaxed some of the um, existing code language in the PUD to allow them um, additional directional signs. Um, but it is important to note that the design of this facility and grounds is ongoing, and we anticipate there will be need for additional signage above and beyond what is currently allowed in the PUD. Uh, when the site plan is presented to the council for consideration, uh, there might be a need to consider those additional signage needs, uh, which we could address at the time through a minor amendment to the PUD if additional signage is needed. Um, but I do think the applicant intends to briefly discuss what some of those considerations might be when they have a chance to, to address the council tonight. Um, so if you have any questions for me, I can answer those now. Otherwise, we could turn it over to the applicant. Council, any questions for Aaron? Yeah, quickly. Uh, the parcel thing that you mentioned, A, B, C, D, E, right? I'm sorry. So um, can you explain what are, the, what are each, in each of those parcels, what is, what is being constructed again? Sure, uh, again, parcels A and B, um, that would be the, the indoor sports and recreation complex and, and the field house. Um, there's also an outdoor um, parcel B there. It's got BC outdoor um, sporting fields. Um, and parcel D about that is strictly parking. Parcel E is stormwater retention. Um, parcel C, that would be municipal park. So that down there, I believe there's plans, tentative plans for a cricket field, um, maybe some soccer fields as well. So the one I just saw. Outdoor sports on parcel C. Um, outdoor. C, outdoor. Parcel A would be the uh, indoor activities. Okay. And parcel C is owned by Ignite or by the city? Parcel C would be city owned. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thanks. Other Aaron, questions for Aaron? I do have a question, Aaron. Um, in the board documents, it, it has uh, Ignite rezoning pond area tree removal exhibit. Is that actually going to have water in it? That 
that uh, retaining area? And again, because we're not at that site planning stage, I don't know if that's planned to be a wet bottom detention basin or dry bottom. Uh, I've got the engineer in the back nodding, okay. saying, saying wet, wet. And you said a lot of the grading has been going on for the last six months. Has this been graded? The detention basin or the? The detention basin pond. My question would be, um, since this is city land, parcel, what did you say? I think it was E. e. Since parcel E is city land, I, I, no complaint to the engineer in the room, but could it not be a little more natural looking? We always see these, you've called it a pond, so that means to me it's aesthetically pleasing, but we've got pretty much straight as narrow sides on the north, the west, and the south, and we're taking out some of the only trees that are in that area. So I'm wondering, is there a way to get to the same quantity that you need in terms of uh, storage and save a few of the trees? Keith Wagon, CDA 3405 Southeast Crossroads Drive, Grimes. Great question. Um, detention on this site is a little complicated. There's a lot of moving part with it. Detention that's proposed on the exhibit not only serves just the Ignite, project itself, but also provides regional detention for undetained flows coming from many, many acres from upstream. Um, in addition to that, um, some of the grading activities that are happening because the site is so low, we're utilizing that opportunity to gain some material to put fill in place. Mm -hmm. these things above the flood mm -hmm. um, and in addition, in the very northeast corner of that basin, we have that green mm -hmm. There's a lot of moving parts there to it, but really it's it's the matter of the, the basin itself. I think about 21% of the capacity is related directly to the tank project, remaining 79% capacity is allocated toward undetained flows from the north that's not being So if you were to use the same area but get the same amount of detention, you'd have to make it deeper, right? Make it deeper and disturb more wetlands, which was the other thing that we've tried not to do. So getting a little more creative shape means more environmental disruption. The pond itself is proposed at about 15 feet. So um, some soil borings were conducted in that area, and that was kind of the maximum recommended depth. No. Oh. Okay. Because I was saying, I was thinking to myself, if you're looking for soil, make it deeper, and that makes it a better pond for you know sustaining itself and not becoming a green, icky mess if it's too shallow. Yeah, definitely not going to be too shallow. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, you've explained yourself, but what I see here is a detention pond in terms of the, the way it's laid out. So if we're actually going to call it an aesthetic thing, and the townhome people are going to say, "Wow, that's pretty cool." I think you need to maybe modify the edges a little bit to make it look a little more natural. Thank you. Sure. And as I mentioned, it's a matter of trying to tackle a bunch of different obstacles at the same time. I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to, I'm asking for some slight changes to make it look more, somewhat more natural. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you have as well. Council, have any other questions for Aaron or for Keith? Aaron, I do have a couple of questions uh, for you. The, the first is you gave indication that there are other recreational areas of our city that have exemptions from noise. Is that codified or how is that currently done? Uh, pull up my staff. cite some specific code sections, so I just want to be able to get them right and read directly from. I appreciate that. Um, not that far down, um, like yeah, up, up about 10, page 10, 8, 9, sorry. If we can make that big enough so, so we can all kind of follow along. Maybe just a little bigger for my um, when I was considering the issue of spectator or crowd noise, um, I specifically 
quoted section 52.01 of our uh, city of Johnson code of ordinances, which um, states this chapter applies to the control of all noise originating within the limits of the city, except when the council has determined that by reason of public acceptance of the activity producing a particular noise or noises, such noise is deemed acceptable to the residents of the city. So my argument is there are other uses throughout town that you know we, we've allowed and we accept the noise almost as a you know if we're permitting the use we're permitting the, the byproduct of the use which when we you know let's say for instance a school is permitted in any zoning district a park is permitted in any zoning district those are uses that you know with with a school um, if if a school is permitted so would be um, a football field or track an outdoor sporting event that might create crowd noise and um, and crowd and spectator noise and so by the city council uh, approving that use you're approving a byproduct of the use which is the noise so in in my opinion rezoning this property to allow an outdoor sports complex signals the council's acceptance of crowd and spectator noise uh, assemblages and, and types of noises associated with with the use to include cheering clapping chanting um, and again, I'm comparing it to, uh, say, Lou Clarkson, um, where you might have uh, crowds cheering uh, for a baseball game or a softball game or a Friday night football game where you're going to have crowd noise. Um, so by, by permitting the use, you're, you're accepting byproducts of the use. So that, that's how I'm making the argument that it's exempt under Chapter 5201 from, from, uh, from being enforced under the noise ordinance. How different is this from the games that's played in the high school stadium and with the residents around? I'm What's, sorry, say that again. So how different is this with the noise we're talking about? You know, I, I really couldn't say. I mean, we're looking at it, it all. I think depends on the number of people who attend an event. And I have no I don't have any numbers about how many people attend a typical Johnston High School football game. Um, Rhett, could you pull back up the maybe the parcel exhibit? And maybe at this point, we can talk about the different types of, of, of uh, outdoor sports activities that will occur on the premises. Um, you know, here on parcel B, there's, you can see that there's baseball diamonds in the um, three corners of parcel B. Um, is that a soccer field that's on parcel B as well? Um, you know, so you're talking about, you've got two teams and, the, and the, you know, probably parents right. that come to, to, to uh, watch their child play the, the sport. Right. Um, you know, I, I really couldn't say how many people will be in attendance at this, but when you look at, say, a facility like Luke Clarkson, where you've got multiple baseball diamonds, um, or even the soccer soccer fields out off of 66 that have multiple soccer fields, this would probably be small in comparison to the number of events that are taking place at any one given time, in, in my opinion. My question was actually, Surrounding this area, there's more commercial properties than less residential property. The high school has more residential properties across it, but I'm going to say is that the noise might not be a problem in this location. I agree, it has less impact. In this exactly. instance, um, the, the residential properties are to the north, and I believe that's the noise as part of their concerns. And I think that you know those concerns I included with your with your packet, but I know there's also some people here in the audience tonight who want to um, stand up and voice those concerns to you tonight. Um, but yes, to, you know, there's no residential units to the south. There's none to the east. Um, we have a, a limited number to the north. And um, we've got really floodplain and, and a large expanse of vacant land to the west before we get to residential units in Urbandale. Um, so, if, um, I'm, like I said, I think there are some people who want to voice those concerns and they'll have an opportunity to do that here in a moment. <clears throat> Aaron, I had a, another question unrelated uh, to the noise, but more about the fact that we're going through that uh, mid-American easement. Uh, there are power lines right over uh, parcel D and the southern part of parcel E. I attended the PNZ meeting where they expressed some concern about really what would be allowed underneath those power lines. Do we have any clarification as to that? And then also, uh, does the POD for parcel a now allow uh, a building right up against that uh, boundary or because I know that was, and that was their specific concern. Exactly. Uh, the power line easement doesn't allow vertical structures. So you can't, um, anything that's going to be built above ground wouldn't be allowed. Um, but of course, parking is allowed. Um, stormwater retention is, is allowed. And so, um, and that's specific, exactly how the site is designed is to do our stormwater retention there in parcel E. 
and parking under parcel D. Um, the, the issue um, that came up at the planning commission meeting was um, the PUD allows for a zero foot setback along that north property line, which means that uh, field house and gymnasium could potentially be snugged up to um, zero feet within that mid-American power line easement. And the planning commission said, um, do we have uh, confirmation from mid-American energy that they would be fine with a zero foot setback against their easement? Um, I reached out to Mid-America and I, I sent an email and asked them to um, provide comment back by the 15th, which would have been, right, yeah, would have been what is today here? I'm losing track of my days. Um, it was last week before I wrote my staff report, so that 15th would have been Wednesday. And um, as of Wednesday at 5, I, I didn't hear anything back from Mid-America. And in the ensuing days since then, I haven't um, received comment from them. So um, they were given a deadline to comment. Um, they didn't comment. I'm taking that to mean that they have no comments on the issue. Um, typically though, they're, they're not concerned with what happens outside the easement. They can't control what happens outside the easement. They can only control what happens within the easement area. And, and what, is, what is that easement from, how, how far away from uh, center point, either of one line or both lines? I believe it's a 225 foot wide easement. Um, okay. If there's anybody on the design team that knows differently, correct me. Does that sound right, Keith? 225 feet is the width of their easement. Thanks, Aaron. I, I do have further questions, but I'd either wait for the applicant or after. Any other questions for Aaron? Okay. Does the applicant want to uh, make any comments? Pat Snyder with Simonson Associates Architects, 1717 University Hall Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. Um, on behalf of the applicant, and I would like to just uh, clarify that the civil engineer is here, already been up here, and there are some Ignite representatives here that can also answer questions if needed. Uh, I would just like to thank staff for all their hard work in putting this together. It's come a long way. Um, and I just want to summarize that we really don't have any objections to the staff report or the QD ordinance. Is there any specific, I know, you know some questions. I don't know if there's anything in particular you have a question about that I could answer right now. Or I will direct one to you if that's all right. And, and it's really regarding more the, the nature of the project as a whole. So I know, and I, or at least I anticipate based on a reaction uh, at the planning and zoning meeting, concerns on lighting and concerns on the sound. We'll address the lighting at a, at a further meeting and site plan. But um, with regard to noise or sound, uh, how would your project be impacted if only parcel A uh, were included for concerts as opposed to parcel B? Uh, my understanding would be that we would not want that restriction over the property. I mean, we understand parcel B as, as an opportunity to host outdoor activities such as marching band con concerts or contests. Um, there could be some sort of festival with the um, activities going on throughout the project that could intertwine with the lap on the both parcels. So we would be against that. Is there any explanation as to why parcel C also doesn't have some of those same uh, delineations as far as outdoor concerts and music? Or is it there and I'm missing it? I'm not sure if I understand your question, but that, I mean, that's the city park. It, it, exactly. And so where I, I realize you're here just to address in essence, parcels A and parcel B, but to some extent, I don't even see on the city uh, side that we requested that type of use. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, typically, you know, Green Days is an example. We hosted a concert um, and that's another one of those things by city acceptance of the activity. Um, you're exempting the activity from um, the noise ordinance constraints. So when Green Days is conducted, you're exempting the noise created by the activity. 
I, I foresee if there are activities that occur on parcel C, it would be treated much the same way that we would do green days because the council sanctions a particular activity on that parcel. Uh, you know, if you, if you approve um, a particular festival to occur, uh, say a green days type activity that might occur on parcel C, it would um, benefit from those same exemptions. Whereas this, uh, you know, something that would occur on a private um, property, they would need to probably specifically be addressed through the PUD language. Thank you so for that explanation. I'm asking for it on um, A and B and not C. Okay, I appreciate that, Aaron. Thank you. And that brings up another comment. I mean, we want to. I think the owner of parcel D would also like the opportunity to host city or join with the city to host events on that piece as well. Thank you. Is there any other questions for the applicant or for Aaron before I move on to any public comment? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the council on this item? Paris Drive, and I don't have any comments, but I do have a petition to give to the council members. Okay, why don't you hand it to Brett? Can you describe what it is? It's regarding the variance for noise. Brett, why don't you hand one sheet to uh, Councilman Reddy and he can pass it down so we can see what it is. Or the whole stack. <laughs> Mayor Darnfield and council members, my name is John Harvey, 6108 Terrace Drive. Um, if you look up here, my house is right there. And I'm in one of the one houses that got noticed because it's within the affected zone that has to be uh, noticed. I appeared before the Planning and Zoning Committee, and we have essentially the same problems now as we had then. I brought up two things in particular. There's a little bit of lighting concern. My, our concerns are, are security. But more importantly, noise, particularly from concerts. We're particularly concerned about the potential that if it proves to be a lucrative activity, that people could have multiple concerts time after time after time. And all they have to do to go beyond nine o'clock is to get a variance uh, allowed to them by the city. We're very concerned that they you could have. Concerts on a regular basis in this in this area. We're not a got the plan and zoning committee. I thought it was a bit of a red herring when I heard the words that it could be a, a marching band concert. I've had friends that were parents of uh, Valley March Masters band. Those people want to make have them on the school property because they want to make money from. Them. As that's one of the ways they buy band uniforms and things like that. So, if you want to, if you think you can have a band concert out there, a, a marching band concert, there aren't going to be very many of them. And I, don't, when we, and I don't think we object to that. What we're more concerned about is amplified music that will, in some respects, feel a lot like the Bel Air ballroom problem with the uh, Waterbury neighborhood across the street, across 63rd Street into Des Moines. That's exactly what we're worried about. We're worried about um, um, whether it's rap, hip hop, heavy metal, or whatever. People having heavy bass that reverberates through 
walls. And we've heard here tonight that we want that the that there is a, a request to have fabric be part of the shell of the buildings. That that fabric is not going to attenuate noise. So you're going to have even indoor concerts are going to be approximately the same as having an outdoor concert, and they're going to allow noise to propagate out into a neighborhood. Now, I've heard a, I've heard some other things here tonight that are a little bit troubling. One of them is compare us to a situation. Look at what's happening out in in uh, the western part of Johnston near the high school. The high school is just built out there and already neighborhoods are encroaching around it. Well, all those neighborhoods were well advised that the high school's already there. There are, there are, there are football fields there and, and there's going to be traffic and they know that and they go and locate there anyway. My house was built 32 years ago and the newest homes in, in there, in, in, in all of these three neighborhoods, Here, here, here. The newest ones were built 29 years ago. So none of these noises, none of these things related to concerts were ever contemplated. We don't necessarily, we don't really object to having this development. We had some minor concerns about lighting. Yes, we would like to have some discipline put on lighting so that there's not late night uh, field tower lighting left on until midnight when, 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 the, when the games were concluded. It, it, you see that at Walker Johnson all the time, they leave the lights on too late over in Urbandale. So we're concerned about that. Could you speak more specifically about what, so you're basically, once the event is concluded, you'd like to see the lights be turned off within a certain right, and we don't want it till 10 or 11 o'clock at night either right I, the, I think the challenge with that is is, is that uh, is first of all i don't know those lights at, at walker johnson that's outside the city of johnson but i, I just it's an observation because i drive along right but here's but the, the, the lighting technology today is significantly better so this is a brand new facility that will have new lights yeah. and those lights will will the, the type of light that they'll produce is significantly different. So I think that, that and, and I think the hard part is that I think if we, if we say, hey, if you, once you put a time limit on lights, I know we, there's various restrictions around that. You have, I mean, you, you know, you, we, you have a rainstorm come along and delay events. Lots of things can happen to, to, to cause that events run long. So I, I, I'm hesitant to knowing, especially that the technology improves. We're talking about an area of town that's, at a, at, a, at a pretty low spot. So I'm not as concerned about the impact on life. Yes, sir, I'm, I'm not really, that was a minor concern of ours that we- Well, and, to I just, and I just wanna kind of flesh that out what you- the big one. Sure. The big one is the noise from concerts. The fact that you have, th that the shell of the building is going to be fabric. And, it, and the, if it's metal sided, if, it, if it's, it, it's just not going to be able to contain the, the music. That's a serious concern for us. We asked the question at the plan and zoning uh, meeting about the uh, about how late in the night those concerts would go, and the response included that there are no place in town has curfews, and so if you don't have a curfew, and if you allow a vari if you allow variances to city to city ordinances, which are not particularly I mean, you all know that your uh, that our noise ordinances are not one of the stronger noise ordinances in the in the metropolitan area. One and of the largest they're, they're noises. Really ambiguous. But the, I think one of the challenges for noises, and I I live in an area roughly as close, is the interstate. The interstate's a major generator of noise in this community, and it's very difficult to control. And something that's outside of our city, so it's hard yeah, to I, control. I, yeah, we already put up with that. It's, it's a whole nother thing to have, have concerts in a neighborhood that's been well-established. One, one of the three parts of it, the largest one of the three, is a HUD unit that is specifically for people over 55. There are plenty of people, I'm, they're my neighbors. There are many of them in their late 70s, 80s, and even 90s. This is not, this is not a neighborhood like downtown Des Moines where people want to go to party 
I heard earlier today that people talk, earlier in this meeting, people talk about tranquility. Other than the interstate noise, this is a tranquil neighborhood. There's not lots of noise in there. We already know at the West End that there are, there are residents that can hear the concerts over in the park, in, in Terra Park. Now we're going to have potentially ter uh, concerts to the south of us, too. I don't hear the ones over in Terra Park because I'm all the way at the east end. But I hope you can understand that we have some real concerns. And so the, if, if you look at the, at the petitions that are from in front of you, you'll see that what we really want and what nobody has done up to this point is actually engage with any residents, no residential neighborhoods. I'm the president of the uh, Meadow Park Townhouse Association. Nobody's talked to me. I can tell you that nobody's talked to uh, any of the other presidents or the, or the board members. Nobody's talked to us about noise. We feel like the addition at the very last minute before this plan and zoning commission meeting of concerts is a bait and switch because this was not ever brought to anybody's attention out in any of the residential neighborhoods. And our understanding is not brought noise wise to the attention of child serve either because we've talked to those people. So nobody has talked to any of the neighboring properties that might be interfered with the quiet enjoyment of their property. Nobody from the city has talked to us. Nobody from Ignite has talked to us. Nobody's offering to say, if you have too much noise, just to say you can't, you can have plenty of noise anytime except from nine to 6.30, doesn't mean you can't have some pretty uh, unacceptable noises during the daytime too. If, uh, what we're concerned about is not folk music festival with, with a banjo and a, and a guitar that's not amplified. We're worried about the, the, the kind of bass that comes with, with I used ACDC because I go to Hawk, Hawkeye games and I, <laughs> <laughs> I, play. I don't want back in black. You just hurt yourself with some of the members of the council. <laughs> So that's kind of, this, is, this is what our problem is. Nobody's talked to us. Nobody's at, they're just saying, oh, trust us. And, and frankly, now's the time to develop the trust by having engagement and, and, and find a way to make sure that, that there are assurances that we're not going to be, uh, uh, we're not going to lose the quiet enjoyment that whatever Interstate 80 allows us to have in our homes right now. So I didn't, I'd take your questions if you'd like. Anybody have any questions for John? Are you able to discuss or, or talk about this petition? I, I, I believe I saw your name on there. I, I, I'm, I'm, I find it. The, the, there is a whereas clause that gives explicit technical information as far as uh, level decibel levels and time frames. How did you arrive at both of those, the, the decibel levels and the time Copy. frame itself? Copied it from the Des Moines noise, noise ordinance. Okay. That's their, that's, uh, there it goes on for pages. I took little pieces of it. I'm not familiar with that noise ordinance. Does that noise ordinance allow for exemptions for outdoor concerts and other um, types of circumstances? Okay. But you don't see the, the situation in Des Moines is a mature, much more mature city than, than we are. But I do know that they're, they're having issues. The new, um, I, I don't know how they're going to deal with them, but the area around Terrace Hill, the governor's mansion, the new amphitheater they put in over at the Waterworks Park is causing noise problems up in that neighborhood. And it's all the way down by George Flag uh, Parkway at the south end of the, of, of the 
water would work. But that's exactly what we're worried about. Propagation of especially bass music up into up into our neighborhood. And, and quite frankly, if it's going to radiate to there, it's going to radiate on into green meadows. And those people who don't know it's coming are going to have this some of the same issues we have with it over time. And we we think it's appropriate to deal with it now, not wait and see it happen and then have people start complaining. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Harvey? Thank you, John. You bet. Is there anybody else that would like to address the council on this item? And it is, I don't mean to um, impose any limitation on you, but it is getting late. If, uh, if you have something new to offer, that would be appreciated. Um, not just repeat what we've already heard. I'm Dick Walsh. I'm the, I'm the president of the Terrace Ridge Association, which is right next to it. And he was talking, nobody's talked to us. I'm not worried about that. I agree with the, the loud music. I've got kids in band, or grandkids really, in band and stuff. And that, that music's not that terrible. It's the reverbs of all the uh, loud music that we're worried about. And there was no real... Uh, Think about light control. And I appreciate Ms. Martin talking about the uh, aesthetics on the swamp they're building in the back mine. I appreciate that. Because that, you know, it, it is something that uh, concerned me. The, other, the only other thing that concerned me about the thing, and, and I, I've got kids in sports, almost every sport out there. And the one that concerns me is the parking is D, and that almost abuts back to ours. If they're going to be charging for parking, are they going to be able to get into our area, our, you know, and come down, walk down our through our yards and, and park in our streets? And would that save them money by doing that? Or is that going to have any kind of barrier there of any kind? And, you know, I was just concerned about that. So, okay. Well, we can uh, get an answer to you for that. But, but I just, you know, that almost butts up to... Uh, the John's you know, area there. And, but mine's, mine's a little further down. Yeah, a few. I also have a uh, petition that was in process. I was at a wedding in Ohio, so I didn't get a chance to take it around. And the person I had taken around didn't do a very good job. So uh, if you want those, I, you know, I'll, I'll continue to fill them out, get them uh, signed. I'll have no problem with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? You might have one more thing. Very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. There's a, you can see the sidewalk that goes around here. Yeah, please don't put your pen on the, please don't put your pen on the screen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we would object to having a sidewalk cut through the trees here. So, because we, we have had problems with people parking and, and then walking out of our neighborhood and we have narrow streets and we don't really want to have our neighborhood tied in with that complex by having a sidewalk extend through the trees. That connects, uh, like the trail that connects from your, uh, having a trail that connects, you don't need to go to the screen, okay. but I, I just gonna make sure the concept. I, that would be a concern for us. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council on this item? Aaron or the applicant, do you wanna, Respond to any of the questions or concerns raised? Uh, lots of comments. Um, there was a few questions in there. I, I, I haven't heard any um, anything from the applicant about charging for parking. I don't know that that's part of their um, business model. They're shaking their head. Uh, with regard to the trail, there is some trail rerouting that's associated with this um, with this development, but it doesn't, there's no planned um, extension of a sidewalk or trail that would go from parcel D to the trail to the north. Um, there's an existing trail. There's an existing trail that kind of cuts down through here and that's gonna be rerouted slightly to go through the, through the site. You can see kind of the footprint there, the dash line obscures the trail outline here. Um, but yeah, there's there's no plan to extend a, a 
connection from parcel D to the to the trail to the north. Um, that's not part of the project. Um, with regard to lighting, um, we're going to monitor the the uh, parking lot lighting and building exterior lighting in the same way that we would do any commercial site plan in town. We've got a um, some some guidelines, uh, actually a resolution that established site lighting guidelines um, that we that we um, impose on every commercial site, and we'll be using that um, for the for the parking lot and the exterior of these buildings. Um, we don't have anything that specifically addresses um, outdoor sports lighting. And so what I've done, I've actually found some guidelines and I've inserted those into the PUD. It's, um, I couldn't tell you right now what section that is. Um, if you can pull up the ordinance thread, I can tell you where I'd address that. But, uh, but because we don't have code language that addresses outdoor sports lighting, I've found some, um, some regulations so that we have something to impose this development um, on this development. It's, it's some dark sky um, lighting standards mm -hmm. and it, it gets pretty technical and I would almost have to have probably a lighting engineer come and talk to this group, <laughs> but, uh, but it's not that it's, it's, un, it's not unrestricted. We provided some guidelines that they have I'm in the here too. Um, and again, uh, Tom was spot on when he talked about how today's lighting technology is very different with the LED lighting and things. It's very directional. Um, they they are, can limit, um, the lighting so that it's only directed to these sports fields and um, it, it's also there's a fair distance um, between where the, the actual sports fields are and the, and the homes are um, the noise issue like i said i we've got some existing code language that prohibits noise um, as discernible from the residential property line um, between the hours of of 9 p.m and 2 a.m if you want to go above and beyond that for this PUD, you'd have to insert some language that would restrict um, noise beyond those hours. Um, but currently, what it's, there's, it doesn't. Uh, there are no restrictions placed on noise above and beyond what the current code allows. <clears throat> and as far as I don't know, were there unanswered questions that maybe we need to invite the applicant back up to address? Anybody? Do you? You're looking like you're leaning forward, aren't you? <clears throat> Um, just address the comment about uh, the last minute throwing in concerts, festivals, and fairs. I mean, that was something that we have discussed with staff um, throughout this process, and we, it was something that we noticed wasn't in there at the on the staff at the staff report. So we felt it was important to get it in there before the PNC meeting. So as I stated at the PNC meeting, uh, just wanted to clarify that point. Could you address just a little bit in, in a little more detail what you have in mind in terms of concerts? I mean, I don't think anybody objects to marching bands, you know. Uh, but the, the operational, you know, scope of this project is still being determined. But I, it's not the intention to go, you know, late into the evening. I mean, are you, do you envision having a concert um, outside every weekend of, of the year? Okay, so how can, how can we give the neighbors? It could be a handful. How can, how, what, I, what I think here's here's I think that part of the part of the what I I think you know obviously this is we're at the PUD stage we're going to keep doing more stuff related to this. I, I you, clearly you, the neighbors are out tonight. This is a good opportunity for you to develop a relationship with them, have some communication. I, I would I'm going to ask two things. I'm going to support this. It may not pass, but I'm going to support it. I'm going to ask you guys to have communication with the neighbors, but I'm also going to expect that the neighbors go into this with an open mind. And I'm, when you when you approach it with a it's a bait and switch, or you approach it with a, with a, without an open mind, that makes it hard to kind of work through and and get to a common ground. And so I think both sides need to make a commitment to one have an open mind to those discussions and two engage in the discussions. And I think if we do that, then we can we can help make what I think is going to be a very successful project even better. And I think they'll hear what your concerns are, and I think they'll respond to them because I think they're the type of people that will do that. But I think it's important for you to approach it with an open mind and not automatically presume that they're out to do a bait and switch because that's not what's happening here. Yeah, they have legitimate concerns. Yes. And we need to listen to those concerns and we need to address them. So how, how, can, how, how can we do that? I would, I mean, from the African side, I would encourage the owner to establish that relationship once we know more of you know what's you know as we get closer to that site plan approval process. sounds like chad has something to say <laughs> i'll 
Anking, Iowa, and I'm I am uh, one of the owners of Ignite, and we 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 insisted on the language being in there for transparency. It really it wasn't, in all honesty. We want the relationship. Anybody that I think the city staff would would say after two years of working together that we're a pretty transparent group. We're here to be part of the community. I'm looking at the group here tonight. and we have a lot of programs. We love to see that the members do. Use the type of facility that we're developing. Um, a little bit just to expand upon um, the usage and why we insisted on some of that language being in there. This is the type of facility um, and we, that you know we're buying for things like uh, 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 AAU uh, National Championship Series is in Des Moines in 2023. They're already looking at us a, as a host site. And we imagine there might be some kickoff activities that go on with that with some music. We're sincere. I, I know there's some, you know, uh, we're shocked at what we come forward with because, you know, this is the majority of those fields are going to be turf. So we're going to have the ability to have multiple football fields at the same place, same complex. Um, I might be wrong, but that's why I don't think it's red herring. I think that we might have a large span competition. But if that's as, as skeptical as we get, then I apologize for that. But I think that we're going to find out we have some music things. Um, if you go to Fordham University, they have they, this exact setup. They use it for commencements, for you know a lot of community-oriented activities. Those community-oriented activities cause noise, and so we actually wanted to step through and insist that some of this gets into the habit. So I apologize if it doesn't seem that way, but so we want to open up the dialogue and I would welcome an open house and a meeting with you know the, the, the folks that are here representing your town homes and get, get people over to see it because I think you'd be excited about what we're trying to get done for the, for the community, um, being a good neighbor. And I honestly think that we want to comply with noise ordinance, noise ordinance and you know, get to a point where if we're going to have something special, we let everybody know. And, but those are just some examples of just the sincerity. And I just wanted to come up and it's getting late, but I want everybody to start to recognize, talk, and get these you know, issues out on the table um, and have you guys over. So I'm happy to do that. Well, this is the first reading of this ordinance. There is time to get together and have this conversation and see if we can. Uh, can't um, make everybody comfortable. One more last comment. <laughs> well, I need to. My name is Star Hendricks. I live at 6078 Terrace Drive. What has gotten me interested in sitting here for this amount of time and signing the petition? When I heard about this development, what I understood was a sports complex and how great it could be in this particular area that was kind of a wasteland because it tied in with the trail and it tied in with Beaver Creek and Beaver Creek would be improved and be rerouted and there would be uh, boating activities developed. And I haven't heard any of that. It's turned into this venue for the music bothers me a lot. Um, that's not a sports complex. That's that's adding something that that I, I'm surprised by. We are 55 plus community. That whole area that's up above. There's we are not going to be out playing soccer or baseball or grandkids maybe, but it's not an area that's going to attract our participation. That's that's not a logical argument. Star, I would just encourage you, Chad has made the offer. I think that the entire neighborhood yeah. needs to sit down yeah. uh, with, with Chad and, and the others that are developing this. And just, just like it's too late. It feels well, like it's beyond that. This is the first reading of this ordinance. I would encourage you to sit down with him and, and, and have the conversation. I would, I would appreciate yeah. doing that. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's because it's passion. <laughs> I know. Um, pickleball, um, right. instead of walking in a mall that's closed down now, you will have a beautiful indoor track. Um, we actually have a seniors program 
that we really are, you know, this is, this is a community activity. Um, during basketball games, I've had individuals come up and say, well, my, my grandson plays here. I want to join your fitness club. So this will actually include um, a lot of activities that I'll enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, Chad, I'm convinced that they just need to learn more about what you have proposed here. Okay, with that, we're still in a public hearing, but is there anyone else that would like to address the council on this item? <laughs> we will close this public hearing then at 10 o'clock. <laughs> with that, do we have a motion to approve first reading of ordinance number 1062? I move. Second. We have a motion, a second discussion. I, I, I do wanna, I'm going to vote in favor of this, but because it's first reading and that we, um, that it sounds like there's gonna be some more discussions here. I'd like to see um, the neighbors talk to the developer and try and come to more of an understanding what their concerns are with noise. But so it's a first reading, I'm going to vote in favor of it, but I am going to expect that we're gonna hear back about how there has been some more meetings and more understanding about the expectations in terms of what the neighborhood thinks is gonna happen and what, what the developer Ignite thinks is going to happen and, and how they can both come to an understanding on the noise. Well said. <laughs> I thought it was long, but okay. Likewise. Yeah, I, I just want to add, yes, we, we want everyone to get together, have this conversation, make sure that everybody understands what's being proposed and what the opportunities are here. I think this is an exciting development for our community. We have worked a long time to, 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 to try and redevelop the south end of Merle Hay Road into something that that uh, you know, as, as people come into Johnson that, that we can be proud of. I mean, this is the face of our community and, and this is gonna kickstart a lot of um, a, a, a amazing things that are gonna happen on the south end of Merle Hay Road. So, um, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be more pleased that Ignite has come forward and has proposed to develop um, in, in this area. And uh, so I just, I want everyone to get together have the conversation, come back to us and, and uh, share with us that, 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 that you've been able to work through the issues. So did we get a motion? Suresh moved, I second. Suresh moved. I seconded it. Tom seconded. Any further discussion? If not, Brett, vote please. Burkhart? Yes. Vote. Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. Motion passed. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate uh, all of the comments and the discussion. Moving on to the non-consent agenda. Item 7A, consider second consideration of ordinance number 1061, amending chapter 170.03 and 170.17. Yeah, we need to consent we have agenda. To do the oh, let's back up and do the consent agenda. I'm trying to get us to the end. <laughs> Uh, item five, the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Have a motion? Second. Second. Discussion? Brett Bolt, please. Vote. Yes. Martin? Yes. Ready? Yes. <laughs> yes. Motion passed. Item 7A, consider second reading, second consideration of ordinance number 1061 amending chapter 170.03 and 170.17 related to regulations for temporary signage. No changes from previous readings. No changes. Move approval. Second. Motion, second, discussion. Preble, please. Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Vote. Yes. Motion passed. 7B, consider second reading of ordinance number 1060 an official zoning map amendment for approximately 1.84 acres from C3 to MUC ROC1. Subject property is located north of Northwest Johnson Drive and west of Inner Urban Trail. There are no changes since the first reading, but I did promise uh, Councilwoman Martin that I would follow up on an issue. Actually, it's not related to phase two or this rezoning. It was related to phase one. She asked about some trees that we wanted to preserve with the phase one. I said, I'll come back at second reading and cover that. 
um, there was three sycamore trees that um, we had asked the developer to preserve on the property or make an attempt to preserve, or the, there was a condition in the um, approval stating have a um, appraisal from a certified arborist stating um, if the likelihood of survival of these trees being relocated or stipulate what the likelihood of survival would be if these trees were to be relocated. Um, a certified arborist did look at that. I provided the, um, his opinion in the staff report. His opinion was they would not survive transplant. So they were given the approval, uh, staff approval to remove the three sycamore trees. There was one existing maple that we asked them to preserve and um, he did provide some photographic evidence that the tree is there today. It's outside the grading limits of the site. Um, there's no specific protections around the tree, but it's beyond the grading area. And it's, I feel like it should be preserved or that it, it's satisfactorily preserved. Um, so I'm just covering those two items. There's no changes um, to the ordinance. If anybody has any questions though, I can answer. Anybody have any questions for Aaron? I do have a question on it. And I'm sorry uh, to delay this, I just don't know enough about my trees. So uh, Council Member Martin, as well as Aaron, I apologize for this, but it appears that the maple that is able to be protected or preserved and the three sycamores are all generally in the same line or, or was that the proposed relocation of the sycamore? The site plan that is provided was the proposed relocation area for the three sycamore trees. Okay. They then went to an arborist and said, hey, if we were to move these trees to that location, would they survive? The arborist said, in my opinion, they would. Thank so you. they were given permission to remove the three sycamores. The maple still stands. And it looked like I was looking at maybe the, the drip line of the tree and, and thinking that it looks like the, the uh, Grading limits were outside the drip line of the tree, so maybe the roots wouldn't be disturbed and that would be sufficiently protected and they wouldn't need to do anything further than what they've already done. Are you in agreement? If you really wanted that tree to live, you would put a fence around it and it would have, uh, you know, stakes buried in the ground. If you, I mean, I know construction sites, that's where the pickup trucks get parked underneath the tree because that's where the shade is. So maybe some uh, orange If they could do orange uh, orange uh, snow fence or construction fence uh, at the drip line of that tree, put a stake every five feet, it might survive from the construction. And it's a very obvious that it's a very good ability to I'll do whatever the council lady likes. <laughs> council lady, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just uh, one question? I, I got it for the one of the things you guys talked about at the last meeting is, is you, you kind of want both of these two units to work in concert and kind of a community. And so as I look at the, I know we're not at the site plan stage for this second one, but it seems kind of like that there's there's a lot of plantings between the two buildings, and and for all I know that may be where this this maple is. But um, to me, it would I, I wonder if you want to think about as you. Put a site plan together or make some modifications to, to bring the buildings in more unified. You, it's your property, you know what you're trying to do. But to me, that was just sort of as I look at it, it, it appears almost like they're not attempting to, to get interaction between the two. And just wanted to throw that out. And it could be the worst idea in the world, and it wouldn't be the first time I had it happen. So. One of the other comments made at the first reading was, Can you reduce the amount of parking? And Barry said, Hey, do I, do I make those changes now? I said, Don't make the changes now because council actually doesn't have the authority at this point to relax the parking. Requirement. It's not a PUD. If it were a PUD, you could do that. Um, I said at the site plan review stage, council does have the authority to relax the parking. So we just ran with this uh, concept that we had. <clears throat> Any other questions for Aaron? If not, do we have a motion to approve second reading of ordinance number 1060? So moved. Second. Okay. A motion and a second. Further discussion? Fred, vote, please. Ready? Yes. Vote. Yes. Martin? Yes. Perfect. No. Motion passed. Item 7C, consider approval of lease agreement between City of Johnson and Child Serve Habilitation Center. Uh, it was 0.6 acres 
two mm. child serve parking lot to the east, the night parking lot to the south, uh, all funneling down to the Johnston Drive extension west of Mohay Road. Uh, this 0.6 acres is currently being used as stormwater detention, stormwater management, five child serve. That will be rerouted over to the regional detention basin directly to the west. Uh, lease is proposed, proposed for 25 years with a 25 year extension by mutual consent. Uh, if Child Serve makes the request, and this will be to return the property to its current state, more or less, given some great adaptations given to the tank project um, at the end of the lease, and would also sign or disconnect uh, the city parking lot from the Child Serve parking lot. Uh, if that became problematic, uh, it will retain its access through the night parking lot. Uh, to get things down. That is a summary of the lease. Uh, if you have any questions, have to answer. Council, have any questions for Adam? If not, do we have a motion to approve the lease agreement between the City of Johnson and Child Serve Rehabilitation Center? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Brett Bull, please. Yes. Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Yes. Motion pass. Item 7D, consider resolution number 21-284, establishing private, private hunting areas for the 2021-22 Urban Bow Hunt Program. Madam Mayor and House members, uh, David Cole, Community Development Department, I can do with uh, two Additional properties, private properties to be considered for the 2021-2022 urban bow hunt. Uh, the first of which is the nickel property, 7365 and 7375 North Court. Mr. Nickel has asked that we allow him and his son to hunt their own property along the property to the east that backs up to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers property. Um, this property was not hunted last year, but I believe in previous years. It has been hunted. And then secondly, the Stanley property, um, 6223 Pinnacle Place. Um, I did receive some correspondence from Greg and Judy Brown this morning that I asked that Brett put on the dials for you guys. Um, basically, they are opposed to hunting. Uh, don't feel that their neighbor is reputable, and therefore, they have some concerns. So if you want to specifically see their concerns, it's written here. Right. I'm gonna no, oh, I'll wait wait for the mayor. Does anybody have any questions for today? Well, I, I'm going to make a motion. I, I, I'm inclined to make a motion to strike the Stanley property from this resolution tonight and allow for some additional discussion. Or if, if the if the if the the Stanleys want to come and make a push, I don't know any of these folks, and so. But to me, they they raise enough question, and I, I I'm not prepared tonight to move forward with a, that approval. But I also don't want to hold up the approval of the nickel one. Um, so my suggestion would be to just strike um, uh, the second property, number two, Stanley, from this list, not saying that we couldn't, you know, act upon additional information, reconsider that, have a new resolution with the, for that property. But, I, but based on what I, I'm not comfortable proving the Stanley one tonight without um, some additional information, either from the advocate or more understanding of it. Dave, can I pose a, a question for you? I know that we uh, um, go through this process of approving the, the specific parcel and even the specific area. We also go through and approve the hunters who hunt that. Is, but is that only on public lands or do we also approve who hunts on the private land? The rule is the same for the hunters, whether you hunt private property in Johnson or you hunt in the public property. The rules and 
restrictions are applied across the board uniformly. So if you chose to hunt your own personal property and the council approved it, you would still have to go through all the qualifications to be considered a valid hunter in the program. But we are not, the, the property owner is not restricted. Uh, they're not the only ones who, who would hunt their property. No, it is totally up to the property owner to just, to, to say who they want to hunt, whether it's the property owner themselves, or it's a cousin, nephew, acquaintance. And, and we have no restrictions on whether or not they monetize the opportunity to hunt as long as that hunter uh, meets the same qualifications as on our public land? No, I've, ne I've never heard of there being a cost associated with. So, someone could rent out their land to someone else to hunt it. Theoretically possible. Okay. So do we have a motion? I, I will make a motion to approve resolution number 21-284 with the removal of property number two, Stanley 6223 Pinnacle Place. Second. We have a motion and a second further discussion. Brett Vogt, please. Martin. Yes. Ready? Yes. Burkhart. Yes. Vogt. Yes. Motion passed. 7E, consider approval of claims in the amount of $3,053,911.81. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Brett, vote, please. Ready? Yes. Burkhart? Yes. Vote. Yes. Martin? Yes. Motion passed. Moving on to item eight. I think we've already heard from Jim tonight, right? Okay. Matt, very quickly, our interstate signs. I know I stand between us and Grand Rapids. So. Uh, there's been a desire to get some interstate signage for Johnston um, out on the I-3580 corridor. And with that, I did reach out to the uh, Iowa DOT and asked about getting some signage. In the um, some signage there at 86th Street as well as um, Merle Hay exit. Um, I did receive correspondence back from the DOT and they uh, will put, uh, if you want to go to the proposed signage, um, they will allow at no cost to the city for us to go at the 86th Street exit. Um, I know it's not our front door, which is Merle Hay. Um, if you bring up the next, so this, this shows what you're going to see east and west mile. Uh, at 86th Street, where it shows Johnson. They're going to move Camp Dodge off to the side for us um, on some what they call auxiliary signage. They couldn't grant us the Johnston at, at, at the Merle Hay exit. And there is already destination or the maximum destination signage on there, which is, if you go to the next, it really shows the current view, which is Merle Hay Road and Sailorville Lake. So Sailorville Lake is the destination there on Merle Hay Road. I'll continue to have conversations with the DOT and see if we cannot get some additional signage there, but it just, it won't be over the interstates like it is in this picture. For some reason, the signage on 141, I, I think, and I, I was going to go out there and look at it, but it's like, there's, there's a couple of places, I'm pretty sure it's 141 that to me should reference Johnston. So I don't know if, if and I, and I could be completely wrong on that but that, but i don't know if you if you've looked at the 141 signage or or not but that would be uh, to me there's some places there that where they have some signage that there's just a complete it's like it talks about sailorville and it talks about camp dodge and everything but not no reference to johnston so i, and I, I don't know if you've looked over that I, I haven't looked at the 141 board or even 100 street. I, I really inquired about 86th street and, and Merle yeah. Hayes. my uh, additional conversations with the DOT, I can take a look at that. Yeah, I told, I, first of all, thanks, Matt, for following up on this. Um, I shared with Matt when he briefed me on the information that he received back that, um, you know, we'll take, we'll take, we'll take the one sign um, on 86th Street, that's progress in the right direction. I'm not ready to give up on Raleigh Road. Sure. It's, I, no, it's I, I, ridiculous right. that, you know, it, it, 
there's a, it's a you know, huge it, sign. <laughs> well, and it, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it uh, shows Sailorville Lake, but it doesn't show Johnston. I mean, Sailorville Lake is, you know, eight miles away or whatever, and Johnston is right there. So, I mean, it's, I think it's just ridiculous that it doesn't say Johnston instead of Sailorville Lake. No, I, I, I would agree. I agree hundred percent with that. So I'm not ready to give up, but we'll take, we'll take the sign that they said that they'll do and we'll work on others. And if there's others, Councilman Cope or anyone else that you think uh, you need to be working on, um, you know. I'll, if I, I'll, I'll drive it someday and I'll, I'll look at it. I mean, you okay. I'm with that. And this was a no Johnson sign. And wait till many am calls them and tips them. <clears throat> okay. Do we have anything else for the good of the order? Looks like we do. This one was very Road came back clean. Uh, the appraisal also came back above the purchase price, so we anticipate closing on that very soon. Unless... Very good. Yeah. Anything else? We are adjourned. I think this is a record. <laughs> so, well, it? at least in this. It took, for getting through the, I, I did want to make a comment. Who, whichever on staff's job is to say, hey, this might be too packed of an agenda. They must have been on vacation this week. <laughs>